Hey, yo, what's good, what's good, what's good? Welcome to Reflections of a DJ, the road podcast presented by DJ City and Beat Source. <laughs> I'm one of your hosts, DJ Crooked. We got DJ Never here. Yo, yo, what up? We got Jamie the Great. Yeah. And we got a special, special guest. This dude is like a mixtape, one of the mixtape kings. Fucking yeah. legend, right? Yeah, of all man. time. He's a DJ, radio, TV personality. He's an author, entrepreneur, all-time hustler. He's um, a retired criminal too, as well, right? This dude was like, a, like this dude was like an arch criminal, you know, for like his, his whole childhood or some shit. <laughs> but we, yo, we're, we're very honored to have him here. Boston's own, Bean Town's own, Clinton Sparks Get in the familiar. building. Let's go. What's up? Thank you get, for having me, guys. Mr. the Get Familiar. Right? Yes. Get Familiar. That was like the biggest tagline of the 2000s. That, yeah, that was yeah. a big one. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for acknowledging this. Yeah. <laughs> Came up with it in my bedroom. Is that <laughs> what it is? Yeah. Like, you know, in 2000, uh, when, I was, when I got on the radio and I was like, man, what am I going to do that's a differentiator? How do I stand out? Because everybody else is a wannabe funk master flex, right? So it was like, everybody just wants to drop bombs. They want to sound like they're as cool, if not cooler than the artist that they're interviewing. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? We doing all this and da, da, da. I was like, what can I do that's different? So I, that was the first thing. And then the second thing I thought about was like, how do I brand myself? At that time, like now everybody's a brand. Everyone's a personal brand. Mm -hmm. But for the first 10 years of my career, people laughed at me when I called myself a brand. Like, what do you mean you were a brand? You were a DJ. Right. And yeah. I was like, nah. When I started, I was like, I need to be like Nike, just do it. So when I created Get Familiar, when I was going on the radio, I was like, I need a tagline because nobody was doing that. So I, I wrote a whole bunch of things and I remember I kept going back to Get Familiar. I was like, ah, oh, it's so dope because I can say Get Familiar with this new record. Artists can say Get Familiar with Clinton. And then I was thinking later down the line as I build a marketing agency, I can license it out to like Get Familiar with the all new Porsche. It was just like a dope ass line. So I knew early on that if I wanted to stand out, I had to do it different than everybody else and I also had to brand myself like a brand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember that shit was everywhere in the yeah, 2000s. Man, definitely. Everybody <laughs> would, people thought my name was Get Familiar. Like people yeah, yeah. would yell, yo, Get Familiar. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it like, yo, you you were like top of the mixtape game, uh -huh. right? It was who were you up against? Who was your biggest competitors? It was like I, I didn't have any competitors, but the no? only person I would say that was like we were on the same level of yeah, dopeness. Yeah. Uh, I will say right now here on this podcast, the most creative, innovative, original mixtape DJs ever to do it is me and Green Lantern. Green Lantern. Oh, so, Green Lantern so we're the two people that were like making mini albums. We were like right. making, we weren't trying to chase your exclusive, we were making exclusives, right? And then, but this is at the time when mixtapes were just bl blowing up because you had yeah. drama, you had Who Kid, yep. and then all you dope. had like all the OGs like Clue and everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. and everyone was killing it. Yeah. So you're saying at that at that point, the only competition you had was Greenland. Yeah, but I didn't. I guess I I, didn't, I never looked at anyone's competition because right. I look at it like I'm dope, and if somebody else is dope, it doesn't make me less dope, and I don't need to compare my dope to their dope. We're both just dope, right? So like that's how I always looked at it. And like Green Lantern, if anything, I was a fan. So like I would like, oh, new Green Lantern, let me get that one because mm -hmm. I want to hear it. So and I hit him and be like, yo, this new intro is sick. Yo, that record you did with Fat Joe is crazy. Like so, so, so were y'all cool? Where like you you would hear like. Like you would see that he dropped a new mixtape. Could you hit him up and be like, yo, send me a link? Or like, can you send me the MP3? Or what would you do? Uh, well, back then it was like, yo, I need to... Well, I owned Mix Unit. So I had well, I, I want to shit. talk about that. Yeah, yeah. so I had your, everybody's shit. So I could just take it from my office and play it in my CD player. So. But this is before Mix Unit. Right. Like, it was just... Uh, it was a CD. There was no MP3 or anything like that. Were you guys sharing? Right. Were you guys helping each other out? Like, no, nobody know. helped each other. I mean, everybody wanted to be the big dog. Yeah, like yeah. Nobody was like, yo, let me, let me look everyone, out for you. Everyone wants the exclusive. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Everyone's yeah. chasing exclusive. Everyone's like hemming up the record executives like, yo, don't give this shit to nobody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, it was also a much tougher time back then as far as like violence yeah. or like aggression. <laughs> it was. Yeah, yeah. Like, there was much more aggression back then too. So motherfuckers were super territorial. I didn't. Like, well, people would... I watched them two beef. I like slide over here and just get the job done and fucking slide back out. Well, y'all yeah. can beef about who didn't get a plaque yeah. or who didn't get an exclusive or who didn't get a drop. I don't give a fuck. I'm just out here being dope. So you yeah. never had beef with any uh, mixtape DJs? No, in fact, I was, I no, I'm, I, I, was, I helped them all. Uh -huh. I built the biggest mixtape site in the world to actually amplify them. I'll give you an example. Uh, Drama sent us a demo mm -hmm. to Mix Unit. And I remember my partners, when we got that, they were like, 
ah, what this fucking shit is whack, all down south shit. And I was like, man, artists go platinum out of their trunk down south. If they have a clue of the south, this guy will be fucking huge. Mm. And they were like, oh, you can take that project on. So like, so as as one of the owners of Mixion, you know, I put it on the front page and started supporting him, reached out to a drummer and Canon, those guys like, yeah, I want to help blow you guys up. Or another example, I was in, uh, you guys know D and Shadow, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so- I was in D's office and he had a stack of mixtapes and I'm just rifling through them and I see a DJ Khaled mixtape. I'm like, what the fuck? Wow. Khaled makes mixtapes, uh -huh. right? Because at that time, Khaled was Miami. Like yeah. if he owned Miami, if you wanted to break in Miami, you had to see Khaled. Mm -hmm. But outside of Khaled, nobody knew, who, right. outside of Miami, no one knew who Khaled was. So I, I listened to his mixtape on my ride back to Boston and I'm listening to him and he had like Timbaland and Scott Storch like recreating their beats on his mixtape. And I'm like, this is fucking dope as shit, but nobody will ever hear this. Right. Yeah. So I hit him up and I was like, yo, bro, I need to fucking help you figure out how to get this shit cracking. I think I went, I think we planned a meeting at Mixture Power Summit. Mm -hmm. And then we had a scheduled meeting. And you know, you know how Khaled is, he's always been the same big, robust personality. Yo, nobody bother Sparks. We got big talk right now. I gotta talk to Sparks. So we sat there and I was like, look, bro, I wanna help you. You got a really great personality. Like you should be way bigger than Miami. And he goes, Yo, remember that little kid? Remember that kid, little Wayne? And I was like, yeah. He goes, he just gave me like 11 new records to put out and I don't know what wow. to do with it. Damn. And I was, and this like, remember he's cash money, but then went away for a while and then came back up. Right, 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 yeah. So like, you know, he gave Khaled a bunch of records. I was like, I know exactly what we should do with that. So I helped him market and promote that. And it did so well that uh, when Lil Wayne performed on Jimmy Kimmel, he changed one of the lyrics in his songs to say mix unit while he was performing. Oh, shit. Sure. Yeah, like, bro, let me tell you something. I'm probably the most successful, influential guy in hip hop, but the least known you at, like, the, you, at the you, same time. You like being behind the scenes, though. You've said that shit. You like being, you know, kind of, you know, not in the forefront of shit, kind of like you like moving pieces behind the scenes a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, the thing I like doing the most is like helping make other people hot or put, making, connecting the dots or making sure this guy's not missing out on opportunities or seeing an open lane for somebody else. I'll tell you though, like 99% of the time when I tell somebody, if I say, yo, never, I see you're doing this and that, but you're not doing this. If I help you with this, it's gonna help amplify those, but open up a new thing over here. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a shot, you know, just use it as an example. You know how many times- Now, I, he needs this talk. No, yeah, we need talk. that talk. No, really talk to him now. Like, like, <laughs> like he it. needs yeah, this. Man. Yeah. Up, man. Get you know, familiar, yeah. remember? You, you know how many times <laughs> I would literally set up the fucking play and lob the ball to someone to hit it out of the park and yeah. they just wouldn't pick up the bat? Right. Like, um. I, I can't even fucking tell you. Like, I could say names right now. You'd be like, what? And like some of the biggest names. I'm like, fucking losers, bro. Like, And I don't mean loser in like a disrespectful way. I mean like- like a winner is Drop fucking just going, like just going, going, go. Opportunity, to take it. Opportunity, to take it, and then figure it out. And I've always had that uh, passion and enthusiasm to do dope shit with dope people. Yeah. And, and then I learned early on that not everybody's dope. But that took me a long time to realize. I didn't know that I had a unique way of thinking. I thought, everybody thought like me. So when I brought great ideas to people, I'm thinking, how do they not get it? This is fucking dope, it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. And then they wouldn't do it, and I'm like, what the fuck? And it took me like, it took me like a decade to realize that most people are not winners. Yeah. Most people are not yeah. killers. They're really just, they'll just do what they gotta do. They still wanna go drink or smoke or fuck around or play video games or watch the game all Sunday and close shop for the weekend. Or whatever it is, it's like, nah, bro, Like I'm fucking working. Call me, working. Where you at? Working. What are you doing? Working. Yeah. And by the way, that's because I love what I do so fucking much. I don't want to do anything else. There isn't anything that I'm like, fuck, I wish I didn't have to work so much so I could go do these things. Because I did, I built a career that allows me to do all the fucking cool shit that I'd want to do. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've kind of learned along the way, like, some motherfuckers are just still kind of like, kind of dealing with all the issues that have gone through their life. They just don't know how to deal with it. So mm -hmm. they, they harbor all this fear, self-doubt, yep. and they haven't conquered it maybe as well as you. Or some other motherfuckers, like, you know, so like it seems like they're just not, they don't want to move. Right. And they're just like comfortable in this space, but they just, they've got so many issues that they kind of have to deal with. And right. they're not as aware as you are. Right. You're probably aware, like, I was uh, listening to a couple of interviews and you're very aware of yourself. And, uh, you know, your child, a lot of the stuff that you went through as, as a kid, 
uh, not all of it, but mm-hmm. some of it, I, yep. I related to a lot of just being aware of other people's energy and mm-hmm. and your own energy, being self aware to know like, yo, this is trauma from my childhood. I, I need to get through it and then push it along to where it doesn't kind of hold you back mm-hmm. a little, right? Yeah, I mean, sort of, kind of. I mean, nothing's ever held me back. I've never mm-hmm. none of the. Uh, I don't know what you're referring to in particular, but whether it was being sexually abused, whether it was an alcoholic father, whether it was being homeless for the broke or yeah. bullied, whatever it was, none of that stuff was like, boo hoo, I'm going through this. Like, why me? Like, ever. It was just, that was just my life. So, like, yeah, we were also from a generation where we don't say boo hoo. Like, we yeah. don't fucking like, right. feel sorry for ourselves. I know, but our, what it, our yeah. generation usually does is fucking just dive into a bottle of liquor. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, that's or, what I mean, though. It's like yeah, self medicating. Yeah. 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 So, so I didn't um, because for a couple, well, a couple funny reasons. One is like, I remember I used to watch friends drink and I'm like, I would never drink six Coca Colas. Who drinks this much? Right. <laughs> I remember thinking that. Yo, <laughs> I was just having a conversation <laughs> with someone and we used to drink so much soda. Oh, like that was like yeah. water. Like it I, was, yeah. It wasn't yeah. like in the eighties, I think. Yeah. It was just like why drink water? We didn't even drink water in we the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even no. remember drinking water no, in the eighties. You went home and you like you either drank like high C tang or even if you had water, you Kool-Aid. mixed it with something. Yeah. 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 I didn't even mix it with anything, just straight up soda. Yeah, yeah soda. soda. That was the shit. It and was, it was either you were either Pepsi or Coke. Yep. Yeah. 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 And by the way, I hate when you go to a restaurant. I don't drink soda anymore. I haven't in like fucking fifteen years. But when I did, I used to hate when I'm like, I get a Coke and they bring you a Pepsi. Yeah. As if it's the same thing. Well, That's yeah. like saying like, yo, can I fuck this girl? I got a dick. <laughs> it's like what? completely no. different, guys. I, I, I don't know if that yeah. one works. That isn't, uh, Let's just make it work, guys. All right, let's make it work. <laughs> you know, have you heard that weird story about Pepsi of like how they were like getting kind of pushed out of the fast food industry? No. Well, Pepsi was getting, this is what I heard. Yeah. Pepsi was getting, Are you spreading rumors? No. Right. I mean, I, I saw- Did you I, get receipts saw, on these facts? I, I saw, <laughs> I stumbled onto this YouTube video. Oh, just fuck so, it. And so, that, so that's real. It's yeah. real. Yeah. It's real. It's on the internet. It has to be real. <laughs> so then, so you, so Pepsi was getting pushed out of all fast food restaurants and their sales were going down. So they ended up buying like KFC and Taco Bell. Um, what Not was bad. this? And so, what and year was this? Like in the- 90s? I know, whenever you, you just saw, whenever you saw KFC and Taco Bell in the same fucking- right. In the same unit. And you're like, that's 90s. weird. Yeah. To be and you're 90s. like, why the fuck is KFC and Taco Bell? And the reason why they bought them and put them together and started franchising it so that they, they could only sell Pepsi just to keep the brand alive. That's smart. Gangster. Through these fucking that's uh, fast Well, that's smart. It's like, it's like, you know, the movie Founder yeah. with McDonald's. But that's yeah. why you probably went to a restaurant and they just kept buying restaurants. So you probably went to a restaurant that Pepsi bought. Maybe. It was just like, yo, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're you got drink Pepsi. This Pepsi, boy. Yeah. yeah. But you know what's <laughs> funny is, that that concept right there is what I've done my whole career. Mm. Oh, word, you guys won't put me on radio, I'll build my own radio show. Oh, word, you guys won't return my calls about mixtapes, I'll build the biggest mixtape website. Oh, word, you won't... That's what I've done my whole well, entire I wanna, life. I want to talk about the mixtapes yeah, because I'm, mixtapes. I'm so curious. Like, uh, like I used to go, you know, I'm, I was a mixtape dude. I used to go to the record stores and i look for the new mixtapes, <laughs> you know. I'm just kind of curious. I don't know if you can even divulge in the numbers. But sure. at what point were you like, what were you moving? I, and then like, how were you, were you distributing and manufacturing your own CDs? Like how did, it, did you go to Chinatown? Like some motherfuckers went to Chinatown and mm-hmm. there were just these like empty factories and motherfuckers were just making these CDs. Yeah. Like what was it? Did you have your own distributor? Were they working with another DJs and doing other shit? Did you buy them out or like, how did that work out? Yeah. So good question. Um, so yes, there was a lot of, so there was a whole industry of graphic designers, manufacturers, right. mm-hmm. mixtape DJs, and distributors. And they all had to work together. So I invented a mixtape distribution in New York City. It didn't exist. So really? I, yeah, I met this kid named AG. He worked at Violator. So you're you're from Boston, though, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So you would travel up to New York yep. to get your CDs done? I, no, no. No, I, no? I would... I, I got different places. I finally inevitably, Connecticut, there was a place in Connecticut that would do it, but I would drive to New York and I would hit all the stores. I'd go to Canal Street. I'd hit the boroughs and drop them off at all. And, the- and then in Boston, was there like a mixtape scene or not yeah, really? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah High yeah. Voltage, Skippy, Whites, you know, uh, Funky Fresh, like all those places mm-hmm. were, were popping. And, and they made, they probably made most of their money with mixtapes. Right. Yeah. Um, so it was a thriving industry. So at that time, they were what, like selling $10 or $20 a mixtape? $10 a mixtape? Uh, and LA was 10 bucks yeah it was it was 10 bucks it was 10 bucks but then like you know 
oversaturation ri- drives the price down. So oh, then, it like, does? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like with anything, right? So then, like, you know, people used to, you could wholesale them at one point for like six, seven dollars. Then it went down to five dollars. Then it went down to like three dollars. Oh, wait, wait. So you, when it was at 10, you were wholesaling them at seven? Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, actually, they were selling them for like fifteen. Oh yeah, that yeah, that's point. right. Yeah. But um, yeah. So then I ended up moving down. So, so that, you guys were always getting fifty percent, pretty much, the or, wholesaler, or more, or more. Yeah. Oh shit. Um, if you like, if you had a hot mixtape, you'd ask for a higher percentage, kind of like, right? Well, it depended. Like, it depended what the demand was for you. Depended who else was coming out. Depended how consistent you were. What kind of exclusives you got. Right. Like, what your name was in the streets. Okay. So that played a role. Like, for instance, like Who Kid was selling masters for like six figures. So he would just go get a mixtape, boom, sell the master, I'm done. He wasn't running around the streets putting out mm. in all the stores. Mm. Uh, Wait, so who, who was the motherfucker buying this shit? There'd be just one person, probably in China, that would buy the master and then they would manufacture and distribute worldwide. Holy so shit. then they would make, it was, a, it was a legitimate illegal business. Of course, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, that's why I want to know that, but like there, you would think there'd be a documentary about the mixtape scene or something, be, yeah. right? I'm so glad you said that. What I've been saying for the past three months is the era, the era of like me, drama, K Slay, Green Lantern, Big Mike. Like Everyone, even the, like Spin Bad, even going yeah, to Spin the Bad, 90s all that, and yeah. all that shit in the 80s, even like with the Kick Capri. Yeah, all the mixtapes. Well, tape, yeah, I was yeah. talking about my era. Well, well, yeah, like, yeah. It, but, but, <laughs> but, but if in you general, talk about yours, you got to talk a little talk, bit about it. Yeah, well, Doo Wop and all Juice it. and Tony yeah, Touch of, yeah. and all those stuff before me. Shout out Juice. Juice is the reason me and Green Lantern were so dope at intros because he was the guy that we heard how he was cutting up different records for an intro. Like, oh shit, we just took it to the next level. And like, so um, I was just talking about how that was an, there was an era in hip hop, but even in music that we were like Kings, like we were the street, yeah, we were yeah, the internet, yeah, yeah. we were the streets, like you, you guys, had to come through us to, there's artists that still exist now that were broken through our mixtapes. You yeah. guys were basically like the Spotify playlist, yes, you were rap for the caviar, streets, for the you were streets. rap caviar, yeah, yeah, that's what you yep. were. Yeah. And I'm like, and if you weren't around then, you don't know about it, you don't mm-hmm. know the significance, you don't know the violence, you don't know the money, you don't know the, the legal shit that went on, you don't yeah, know the camaraderie, yeah. you don't know like the struggle, the hustle, like, there's a, that's a whole fucking series mm-hmm. on it on itself. And yeah. I've been saying like, this has to come. And I started, I went and met with a producer in Hollywood recently. I was like, I want to make this because I'm friends with every single DJ that was around and relevant. Let me go do it. Cause they're going to do, they're going to keep it totally fucking real with me. And I'm going to ask them the questions that motherfuckers really want to know. Yeah. 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 So I, I actually just started ideating, creating the quintessential. I'm thinking of a name. Okay. Is what I'm thinking of, but because I, I was call it like, mixtape kings, right? Well, or I was thinking, well, like that. well, well yeah. I was, I was thinking like it, it won't be this name, but the the concept of when we were kings made me think about like, man, we were the, we were the top dogs, bro. Like, yeah. you yeah. had some new shit. You needed to come see one. I remember I used to book studios in New York, and I'd hit record labels like, yo, I'm coming to do shit, and then like. They just have artists lined up to come in and do freestyles that wow. turned out to be Joe Budden, turned out to be, yeah. you know, like it, rappers would just be in there. So you guys had so much power, huh? Oh, yeah. Over yeah. the music industry, over, over well, hip hop, right? And then I had people that were in my position had even more because I had multiple radio stations on lock and I was a mixtape DJ and I'm a platinum producer and I'm on TV and I'm doing all the hot clubs. So it'd be advantageous for you to be my friend because I can do a lot for you and I have a lot of value to add to you breaking your records. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I did that intentionally so I would have that much value. Of course, yeah. <laughs> like even when he's I started, like, he's like the Gary V of like yeah. of like the hip hop yeah. people like literally, music industry. I've literally heard people say Clinton's the hip hop Gary V. So he doesn't like the Jets. When know? I started, he's like, like, this is how you win and how to not be a loser. Go right? to the rock you sales. fucking losers. <laughs> <laughs> how many losers I've talked to? You fucking lazy fucks. You don't want to do the work. Me. You're yeah. not listening. To I mean, there's way more losers than winners, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so wait. So wait. All right, I, I'm fascinated by the mixtape. So then you you kind of figured out that you said they're designers, the manufacturers, and everything. So yeah. you somehow hooked up something in New York, right? Mm-hmm. Were you all kind of using the same designers, or you wanted your own? There were different ones. So like there was like each one of those categories had like the star name. 
right? Yeah. So like, there's like these two guys make the best fucking covers. If you can get him to do your cover, you're in the elite. Right. If you these guys won't even manufacture your shit because you're weak. You ain't even doing numbers. Okay, so how like right? a designer, like the top designer, how much are you dropping? He giving him what like five hundred? Oh, I don't even remember. Yeah, okay. it was around. It was, it was like a couple hundred. Couple like, hundred. Okay. Yeah, three hundred a cover or something like. And that. And then these dudes were probably doing like I don't know five mixtapes a week. I, uh, maybe you gotta ask them. I don't. Yeah. Know, I don't know what they're. And then you were, were trying to drop. What was your schedule like? A we weekly, bi-weekly, monthly? Uh... Put it this way, I did over 110 mixtapes in my career, which equals 10, mi which makes a mixtape a month for over 10 years. Oof. Wow. So, and remember, if you listen to my mixtapes, which a lot of them now are still current today, because if you haven't heard them, you haven't heard them, because it's not songs that you know. No, it's mm -hmm. So they're like albums still to people that yeah. are new. So yeah, yeah. the yeah. time it took people like me and Green to put a project together, was like, like it would take me fucking three weeks sometimes just to make my intro. Because you guys were doing like a lot of more original music kind of making shit from Yeah, and then even our intros are like three minutes of cutting up like a thousand different records yeah. to say, to give you messages. Like, right. you are ain't fucking with me, 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 take a step, take a stop, stop. Listen, do it again, take a fuck y'all, dip it DJs, like the whole shit was just like. That was good, I would have stole that shit yeah, back yeah, in the day. Yeah. <laughs> what was that, a crab right like, there? Slow, slow down, slow Slow down, down. stop, <laughs> stab, baby. No, but I mean, like, when we all I, did. I, I used to, I did, when I made a mixtape, I was like, I gotta make it sound like these yeah. motherfuckers. I gotta have at least the first minute be yeah. some scratches. Yeah. That's yeah. How I, the, the intro will make it or break it for a lot of mixtapes back in LA. Right. Like, either you, if, if the intro was hot, you, that shit was. But you guys out here are different than us. You guys out here were more like technical scratchators no, no, like, out here. Yeah, but it was still like, if in it was like hot scratching and shit. Yeah. Then we buy the mixtape because we would have to go buy them at Santi Alley. So when you mean scratch, you just mean like, like no, that like, kind of. No, the shit you just explained. Like if we heard that shit, and it was like, yo, that's some real shit. Then we'll buy the mixtape because that's where uh, in Santi Alley, a guy would have a boombox and then a fucking like a, a wall full of mixtapes. Yeah. And you ask him, yo, play this one, and yeah. then the intro was hot. Then right. you buy it. Yeah, that's it's just like life. Like, you got ten seconds. Yeah. yeah. Ten well, seconds to get someone's attention. Like, if you go talk to a girl and you say some dumb shit, over. So you know what I mean? So, <laughs> how were you making sure that you were getting distribution in Cali? Like, were they hitting you directly? Like, uh, it was a mixture of me. So, what we would do back then is we would just look, hear shout outs on someone else's tape. Who's that? Or we would see us write something on the back. Or as you travel, you'll just. Well, how I started is I made, I don't know, 5,000 mixtapes. I got in my truck and I drove from Boston all the way down to Atlanta. And anyone that looked like they listened to hip hop, I went over to sneaker stores, barber shops, clothing stores. Right. Sneaker stores was big in LA. I pulled over record stores and then people that were even sitting in their car at a red light, I'm like, yo, <laughs> throw, yeah, it, throw it in their window. Because, yo, this is a time <laughs> when anything remotely uh, relevant to hip hop, they were kind of selling mixtapes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So even a sneaker store, a sneaker fucking store everything, yeah. sneaker like store they were selling some grocery yeah. stores in the neighborhood. Yeah, they were selling yeah. Mixtapes. bodegas. bodegas. Yep. Yeah, or yeah. like the J Jamaican shop. You know what I'm saying? Also like the back then, shop had it. Yeah. You know. Also back then, people were excited to get free shit. You know, now right, we get right, something free, yeah. we're like, fuck out of here. I don't want to yeah. carry this shit. But like back then, you give someone a mixtape and your cover looks fire. Yeah. yeah. Yo, oh, word, I get to have this thing. People were actually were happy yeah, that was to crazy. get shit for free. Yeah. yeah. There was value in music, right? Oh, yeah. Back then, there's no value in music yeah. now. That's the problem. It's funny because yeah. I would go to Warehouse Shoe Sound if you spent 50 bucks to get a free mixtape or whatever it was shit. that week. Hmm. So you wanted to spend 50 bucks on whatever the fuck just to get the free mixtape. So. Wow. Yeah, I remember that. They probably gave you the wackest mixtape that wasn't. No, there's some good <laughs> shit. There's some good shit in there. So then, at some point, you were you were moving so much weight, right? <laughs> you were moving so many so much CDs. Well, it was so pretty fucking heavy. Yeah, pretty heavy. <laughs> Jewel cases. You were right, moving right. so much weight at some. Oh, point. when slim cases came out, changed oh. the fucking game, the game. from those yeah. thick I ones. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. that was those sleeves, yeah. just a cardboard sleeve, and that was yeah. it. And you didn't have to have like back artwork anymore. No. Yeah, yeah. You, it was it was on the actual cover. The yeah, yeah, yeah. back was the cover, but yeah. you didn't have to open up the plastic breaks. It's a fucking broken cover. Put the sleeves inside. You had to actually assemble everything too. You'd get mm -hmm. the jewel cases, the covers, and the CDs all separate. So I'm calling five people over, spending two days, literally just putting all my shit together. Were you shrink wrapping your shit too, or not? I didn't, but some other stores would do that. Oh shit! So wait, so. And you were moving so much that you, what what came along to start the, the mixunit.com thing? Uh, well, two things. It was a combination of me being uh, frustrated from like dudes in the hood not doing good business or customer service. So they would like, you, when you got a mixtape ready to go at two on Tuesday, you ain't got time to wait till Thursday to get a call back. 
That was one. And then two, I want my money, bro. Where the fuck's my money? And I got to wait for you to fucking get Paul to pay Peter. And it's like, I was oh, just- So there's a lot of shady motherfuckers that well, don't want to pay I don't, I don't want to say shady, just like not- just running, business running around, savvy, not yeah. diligent, <laughs> not business savvy. So I was like, "Fuck! How can I create something that has great customer service, that treats the DJs well, and markets amazingly?" Simultaneously, I met my partner Mike, who was thinking the same thing. Who's not even a DJ. He's like, "I got this idea to make uh, vending machines with mixtapes," and I was like, "How about fuck that and let's do a website." Where we have all the hottest motherfuckers up here, and da da. So then that's well, how we created mixunit.com. What year was this? Like 2003? Uh, three or four? Uh -huh. And, is, and then I remember, I, I, because we were doing so, we were the, the site. No one else even yeah. mattered at that point. And then a bunch of, my, a bunch of people I knew, because we were doing so well, they, they couldn't do business anymore. They had to shut down. Mm -hmm. And one of them was my friend. He's like, man, fuck you, Sparks. Like, what, what am I supposed to do now? And I was like, bro, why don't you? Be an aggregator that gets all the videos of the shit that goes on on the hood and that hip hop clubs with these fucking stabbings and fightings. It was like a bum fight era, right? So I'm like, why don't we? Why don't you get all that shit and put it on one website? Every fucking white kid no fucking in the world way. would love that. And he was like, dope. And that was the creation of World Star Hip Hop. No way. You gave that to Q? Yeah. No fucking way. RPQ, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Great Rest guy. Peace. As a matter of fact, the year. So Q, so Q was in the mixtape game. Yeah, yeah. And he was selling it, and you ran him out. Yeah. And then, but you gave not him the on idea. purpose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, but you, uh, yeah. So you gave him the idea for World Star. Yeah. And then uh, the year before, he, as as before he passed, he was coming to my apartment like I don't know every few weeks because I was um, I was trying to tell him for years how to elevate that business from just. I say this with all respect because he's my fucking boy and everybody over Danny everyone's my boy but I'm like bro you keep you running this shit like a fucking trap house I'm like let's turn this into a big business blah blah, blah. And like I remember I brought a coke deal to him one time and he passed on it because Coca-Cola Coca 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 yeah yeah, yeah. Coca -Cola, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said Coca-Cola <laughs> properly earlier, and right now I'm like Coke. Girl, you said Pepsi and Coke. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You said a private uh, Coke deal. I'm like, whoa. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> now he's saying, he's shitting on it for running it like a <laughs> trap house. He is yeah, yeah, yeah. a trap he's house deal. Touché. <laughs> now I see why Jamie's the great. Uh, <laughs> I got to do the PR over here, yeah, baby. Yeah. So then, like, you know, he passed on that. It was all good. Then I remember um, they did the World Star uh, College Tour. So, I, so I, did, I DJed on there. And then I'm like, bro, man, we need to start fucking diversifying this shit, man. We need to create a festival, World Star Festivals before Rolling Loud. Uh -huh. We need to create our own record label and distribution here at World Star. And then what else we need to do is we need to go find black screenwriters in the hood and then like develop their films and then upstream them to Revolt. And then we've got Puff involved. We were all talking about doing all this stuff. And the reason I'm telling you this story is to show you how great of a heart Q had. So there was one time he was leaving, I walked him downstairs uh, at my apartment. He was getting into his car and he goes, Yo, Clint, how much percentage you want a world star? And I was like, what? And he's like, he's like, how much percentage you want? I was like, nothing, dude. I, I, I'm, I'm doing this because you're my friend. And then he was like, nah, you've been here since day one, and you're still here trying to help me. Like, you, we need to figure this out. And I was like, dude, I wasn't doing this for any of that. I was doing it because you're my buddy. But if you want to, you know, do something, it's up to you. And then before we ever got to that, he passed away. Mm. But like, how beautiful of that was that was right. him to to recognize. Well, realistically, the dude gave me the idea, and he's still here later, trying to help me elevate yeah. this. Yeah. So well, he's rest in peace, Q. Well, the, wow. like to to also just to have that kind of gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. to, yeah. Even like because some people you give and you give, and yeah. they think that's the standard. Yeah. They don't think they have to give back. Right. And they just think, oh, that person's here, and they're always going to be here to like hook me up. Yeah. But he kind of looked at you like, yo, this dude is giving me so much. I'm in an opportunity to give back to him. How and I never ask yeah. for anything. Yeah. No, yeah. I've never asked for anything either. Yeah, that's not very giving so guy. Bad. Yeah, damn, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah. That's a crazy story. Yeah, so you, I, we got thousands of those guys. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I missed Mr. Mr. Hip Hop Gary V. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm sure. Hopefully, we'll get like five I'm, of the I'm five like, or so of them. I'm like the Forrest Gump of hip hop. I've been a part of like almost fucking everything dope that you just wouldn't know because mm. one, social media wasn't around, and two, I didn't do it for the fame or the clout. I did it for the good of culture and for my friends that I wanted to help. I'll give you an example. If you, do you guys know that we got it for cheap series I did with the clips? No. Well, oh, get familiar it, with your yeah, fucking yeah. hip hop history, all right? It's a classic and it was Rolling Stone's top 50 yeah, yeah, album. Yeah, yeah. We, oh, we got it for cheap. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, so I did that series with them and they were on MTV one time and uh, they were like, man, you guys must have made a lot of money off that. And, they, and one of them said, 
yeah, Clinton's probably buying houses, right? And I was like, damn, do they actually think I made all this money and didn't give them any? And then so at that time, they changed their numbers. So I couldn't get in touch with Pusha, and then I ran into them. So I said, hey, guys, come here. I got to talk to you. So we went to the corner or whatever, and I was like, you guys know I never made any money off We Got It For Cheap, right? And I was like, oh, no, nah, it's cool, man. It's cool. Like, you know, do your thing. Yeah. I was like, no, dude. I, in fact, I lost money because I would press up boxes to take with me on tour to give away for free to promote them. I wasn't getting reimbursed for that shit. And I was like, dude, if I made a dollar, you would have made 50 cents. Mm -hmm. Like I would have never, ever fucking made money and not shared it with you guys. And that concept is how I've lived my whole entire career. Like I will lose money before I damage my reputation or you know affect a, a relationship negatively. I don't, I don't, money, there's money everywhere. You can get money doing anything. Mm -hmm. If you start off just the nucleus and the, the core of who you are is just doing dope shit for dope people and just being good human being and actually giving a shit about other people, the money will just come. But most people are focused on the money. How much can I get for that? Yo, what you got? Yo, what's up with the bag? And da da da, da. Like, yo, the bag is your reputation. The well, bag is trustworthiness. Where did you learn that though? Because in your, in your upbringing, like in your childhood, it was very much like kind of you were fighting to survive. You mm -hmm. were like doing probably B&E's. Robin like doing burglaries as a young ass kid. Not probably. Yeah. Was. He was doing beanies. Like, yeah, you was like a Stealing up, cars, like yeah. all that shit, yeah. So at what point did you just realize that, yo, like the reputation has to has to be stronger than like, you know, than my focus on. Integrity, yeah. Yeah, your, your integrity has to be, you know, more important than, you know, well, the bottom line sometimes. Um, That's kind of like a, a question with, it has a lot of branches on I'm it. I'm sure. Right? Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry about that. But no, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know which way to go first. Um, well, I will, I will t I'll, let's talk about your childhood a little bit because I was, I was kind of, I, I related to some of the things you were saying because you kind of grew up in a fucked up neighborhood in Boston, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of grew up broke and poor. Mm -hmm. And you were, I don't know, you, in most situations, you were probably like the only white kid around a bunch of like you know maybe right. minorities blacks right. and latinos or right. whatever and you were talking about kind of like being able to navigate through situations like being able to read people read situations so that you can kind of get out of situations safely which i you know when i was growing up in new york i was probably the only asian kid growing yeah. up in a black latino neighborhood right so like I had to know how to talk to certain people. I had to know if they were gonna like fuck with me, how Jump I could you, get out yeah. of the situation. Yeah. You know, like I, I I would spot trouble like blocks away. I'd be like, oh shit, wait. I know that I, I see these motherfuckers two blocks away. I gotta like make a move or I gotta do I gotta like navigate. Take myself. the long way home, yeah, yeah. Or you just, developed like, a yeah. heightened uh awareness. Awareness, yeah. right? And even to the point where like you can read when motherfuckers are trying to play you mm -hmm. yeah. and like all of this shit. But mm -hmm. You were talking about that and how it's helped you in business yep. and in situations and, and knowing how to adapt like on the spot. You were doing what, B and E's? Like you were yeah. like 11, 12? Uh, from, from 10 to about 15, I was robbing houses, stealing cars, credit cards. And I wanted cars. to know who taught you this shit? Nobody. Uh, so when you, I, I didn't have any like adult males around. I didn't have any leaders. I didn't have no bad influences around. I didn't have anything. It was really just figuring out life by trial and error, but out of necessity. I didn't have nice things. And like, and I did it. I did my dirt all by my lonely too, yeah. just so you know. So I wasn't like, yo, let's go get this. Let's go do that. Like one, I was never proud of it. Two, I didn't want to brag about it. And three, I knew just like now, even in business, I can always rely and trust me. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to do the right thing. I'm going to show up and I'm going to make sure the job gets done. So when I was even robbing, it's weird because I hate even acknowledging how much of a shit bag I was as a teenager when it came to robbing. But it's funny. It's ironic that I'm going to say this, but I was like a, a criminal, but I actually still gave a shit about people and had a heart. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, if you if, maybe I said this in the thing you heard, but like, if I got orders for like a VCR, a video camera, a TV, and like I, I got into a house and they had it all, I would only take one. And then I'd go to another house and up my chances of getting busted or shot because I didn't want anyone to ever come home and their whole house was wiped out. 
because I thought about my mom, how she worked so hard for us. And it's one thing if our VCR is gone, like that fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. Who took our fucking VCR, right? But when everything's gone that you worked hard for, <laughs> that's fucking, yeah. that's devastating. Yeah, I give you props. Like, the fact that you're like, so you was a thief with a conscience. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you might even question yourself like, did I put my VCR somewhere? I don't remember. But like Who if everything's missing, thing? you're like, and I was super good about it too. Like I figured out ways how to break into windows and put them back so you didn't know. There was one, one time I went to a top of an apartment building, cut a hole through the sheetrock, lowered myself down, took the shit out, then pulled the sheetrock back up. You didn't even know how I got in the house. So it was like, I was super inventive. <laughs> That's a movie right there. Bro. As, a, as a kid. So you were doing this because you're like, yo, like I want nice shit and my family can't get, my, I, we can't get nice shit and this is how I get nice shit. So you were much. selling the like the VCRs and the TVs to other people. Yeah, yeah. I and then we had some in my house. We kept some in the house too, which is weird because you think my mom would be like, "Where the fuck did you get yeah, this?" Yeah, I was from? gonna like, say, "Where the fuck?" Like your three and DVDs. Just, and and I was week? like, "I don't know, ma. Someone gave it to me, right?" But um, it fell off I a truck. I found it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I said all those things. Um, <laughs> but I remember the very first time I became a criminal. Oh, let's hear it. Uh, so I was ten years old, and we lived in an apartment building in Dorchester. And I could smell. So I used to go to this guy down the hall's house and try to take out his trash for a couple bucks. And it's just something about his like well-being didn't seem stable. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this guy's gonna die. So then for like a week, <laughs> for like a week, the building smelled like death. No right? way. That's, yeah. some, that's some good sensibility yeah, for yeah, a 10 year old. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's about to kick the car in two weeks. Yeah. I don't know if I was 10 years old looking at motherfuckers like, yo, he about that. to die yo, soon. Yo, side <laughs> a funny And then side smelling note. shit like, yo, this motherfucker's dead, yo. <laughs> he, <laughs> might be, yo he smells it. This is stench. I was <laughs> right. Aha. <laughs> My go. nose is. <laughs> um, He's but, like, finally. You finally. know, it's funny. Side note, traveling as a DJ, I've been on flights three times where people died on the flight. No oh, way. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, and, okay. and, and the third one, wait, coming from Africa, they brought this guy on the flight. I mean, they had to like hold him up. He looked like fucking the crypt, right? So like, so this guy's in front of me, we're all looking, and I'm like, ah, oh, that guy's gonna die on this flight. And, they're, and, they're, and, they're, you know, you know, and the guy's in front of me, I didn't even know the guy's in front of me. They're like, come on, man, how do you know? Dad, Have I go, some hope, I go look at him, you think he's gonna last this fucking ride, this whole flight, he's gonna die, right? <laughs> Lo and behold, Three hours later, is there a doctor on the plane? Is there a doctor on the plane? So they call him, they go him, he's dead. They got to lay him in the galley, dead body in the galley. So it. now fucking, it's starting to stink, rigor mortis. So we got to turn around and go back to fucking Africa. Uh, oh, you started smelling this shit? Yeah, God, we had to go damn. back to Africa. Yeah, he decomposes within an hour, bro. Yeah, body it was already drops. starting to smell. Everyone's like, turn around, we got to go back to what Africa. Is what does that smell like? I don't even know what you know, that smells like. like it's yeah. it's pretty rad. Right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so back to the first criminal thing. Uh, let me bring us yeah. all back. Right? <laughs> back. So, wait, okay, remember, we're smelling a dead guy. You're, right. All right. You're 10 years old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone in the building's like, what's that smell? So it must be the dumpster, right? So um, I'm like, I had a feeling this guy was dead. And I knew he had a bunch of shit in his house. Mm -hmm. And I needed batteries for my handheld Galaga player. <laughs> he needed two double and I knew he started with batteries. And I knew he had a shit ton of batteries in his house. <laughs> so I figured out how to break in his house and I stole all of his batteries and I seen his dead body. And I was like, oh shit, he is dead. <laughs> I took all the, the, all the batteries. <laughs> and I remember I told the guy, the guy who, en who ended up becoming the guy that molested me, I remember he had a feeling of what I did because I remember him saying, in the 80s, you believed like demons and shit like that, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's like, so why Thriller worked, right? So he was like, you know his body's gonna come back and get those batteries. And I remember my, my bedroom was on the second floor and I threw all the fucking batteries out into the woods. <laughs> I was like, I don't want no fucking demons coming in my room. Wait, so when that, you got a taste of like how easy it is to just go into someone's crib and just take some shit if you want it? Yeah, I guess, well, I think even before that, I think I used to steal from like department stores. Um, but yeah, that was just like a, yeah, shit. I mean, but you're doing it, you're doing it out of like, not just being a, a shithead that robs, right? even though Robin's being shitty, but like mm -hmm. you're doing it one, cause you don't know better, right? As a kid, you don't even really realize mm -hmm. like this is completely wrong. You have a feeling you're not doing something right, but you don't realize just like even being sexually abused. Like you don't even know as adults, you can be like, why did you tell somebody? Why'd you do this? Why were you still friends with the guy that was molesting you? Like, it's weird to a logical adult thinker mm -hmm. yeah. when you're a kid and you don't know any better. And this is all you know is dysfunctional mm -hmm. love, like molest you that night, buy you a toy the next day. 
Yeah, it God seems damn. like it's weird, oh, wow. but I don't know. It's the only guy showing me love, right? So like, you don't know these things until you get older, and, and you never had back. a male figure right. in your life. Yeah. So, so when you when you so anyone that's been raped or sexually abused, and like you ask simple questions like, why didn't you tell anybody, or why didn't you do this? Like, ninety percent of the people don't have the answer to that because they don't even fucking know why. Mm. I went and sold that guy a vacuum cleaner when I got older. How bizarre is that? Wait, wait, wow. Where, did, yeah, where were you selling vacuum cleaners? You Dude, were, I had a hundred fucking jobs yeah. in, when I was young. Holy shit. Dude, I, I lived 10 lives by the time I was 21. Wow. And the trauma never caught up to you at any point? No, nah, because I never looked at things that happened uh, to me. I look at it like it happened for me because it made me the person I, I that's was that's to, to do the things I did and made me the person I am today. And I like the person I am today. So... Uh, I built myself by design, not by circumstance. Most people usually let the circumstances of their lives dictate how they're going to act or live or react. And I knew early on, like, like I didn't do anything wrong. That guy did. Why would I be troubled by him doing something wrong? I was the victim. Yeah. Or like, mm -hmm. my dad left me. I didn't leave him. Why am I going to be bothered? Of course, as a kid... You know, and a boy, even sometimes now, I might watch a father-son movie and tear up. You know, because it's, it's, those things never leave you. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just a matter of, like, how you deal with them and how you accept them and what responsibility you, you play a role in that. And, like, <clears throat> even when I was young and that guy was doing that, I recall thinking to myself, why does this guy do this to me? Like, what happened to him that's making him do this to me? So I've always been super analytical of like, even bullies, like, I wonder why they and, pick and, on me. And somewhat empathetic, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Very empathetic. Yeah, and you know, I'll tell you, a key to life, um, speaking of empathy, is, so at 15, my mom was sick of getting me from the police station, so she sent me to my dad, because I was in the city. She sent me to the suburbs with my dad, to live with my dad, at 15. And he was an alcoholic. Because you, you, you were wilding out. Yeah, yeah, she was, she was done. So, um... No, he was an alcoholic. And, and wait, just just for a reference, I want you to continue this. I don't yeah. want to. I sorry to interrupt you. you were, did you, were you DJing at this time, or you weren't no. DJing at all? Well, not professionally. So at this time, I had stole turntables. That's what I wanted to get. Yeah, and I had them. So at like twelve or thirteen, I had the setup in my house, and all the eighteen-year-old kids would come over while I would DJ right. and play instrumentals and beatbox. And I wanted to be a rapper. That's what I was doing at first. I was a dancer and a rapper, and I was winning all the talent shows. I opened for Buster, Missy, oh, wow. as a dancer. Um, in fact, like yeah, I opened up at the Boston Garden. Dancing. Damn, the right? thing. And uh, rapping. This motherfucker was dancing, rapping, robbing. And robbing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the dancing, fucking rapping, real. robbing. Uh, anyway, uh, so you were wilding the fuck out. Your mom said Yeah, you so she you. sends me to my Father. dad. Yeah. It's juice right here, man. Yeah. 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 And, uh, the original Q. Q. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Bishop, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Allegedly, allegedly. Yeah. So, um, so she sends me to my dad. I live with him. And, you know, that was, it was great. It was definitely a, form, a, a formating time of my life. Um, but my dad would always say things to me like, that's not the way I raised you because I'd still be getting in trouble at school. And it always bothered me because I'm like, eh, you didn't fucking raise me. Right, right, right. right? And like, yeah. it bothered him the day I finally said to him, you didn't raise me. So he got pissed off at that. So we ended up having like that big father-son fight at 18 years old. Like, fuck you, fuck you. And I was like, when I grow up, I'm going to be a way better fucking father than you. And he's like, yo, fucking see, life happens. Um, so then I left and I'm like, I'm never fucking talking to that guy again. <clears throat> So then like, I don't know, three, four years goes by and I'm thinking about my father and uh, I was like, it made me think about like what, may, what happened to my dad that didn't allow him to be the man I needed him to be mm -hmm. when I was a boy. And when I took the time to care about that yeah. thought, when I took the time to care to go find out what happened and I realized like, shit that's like what the fuck his dad used to beat the shit out of him and mm -hmm. you know he has a, a, a tumultuous relationship with his mom and then he gets sent to vietnam a fucking war yeah. Yeah. you know what i mean like so like how do i expect a 24 25 year old guy that went through all that to be a great dad right yeah. you know what i mean so when i thought about that my my resentment turned into empathy mm -hmm. and then me and my dad went on to become best friends i went to him and i was like look i forgive you i'm sorry what you went through and we became best friends so i share that because it's a key to life that i learned at around 21 it's one of the many keys but that key of like caring about other motherfuckers and what they're going through 
And having empathy more than resentment or hate or jealousy, I'm telling you, man, it'll fucking carry you so much fucking further. And look, it's a testament to even coming up as a DJ. I never cared what some other exclusive a DJ got. I never cared about a gig that he got. I never cared how much money he made. I never cared about a plaque that the label sent them and not me because I didn't give a fuck. That wasn't part of my plan. My plan was to become a successful fucking winner by doing the things that I set out to do with milestones and keeping track and score of my fucking life. And it was never getting this, getting a plaque, getting a pat on the back. It was never, those are great if they come, but it wasn't part of the plan. Therefore, it doesn't bother me. And I also learned early to remove my emotions from everything. So whether someone's like, yo, you're the dopest motherfucker ever, I just look at it like, okay, I'm doing a good job at my business. Yeah, if yeah, someone's like, yeah. yo, you're whack, it doesn't affect me because I'm just like, all right, maybe I need to improve on these things. It never hit me yeah. personally. So do you think that thing that happened with your dad and you kind of felt like, you know, getting to terms of like understanding where he came from and what was going on, do you think that helped you kind of like, like we're, we're t talking about integrity, right? And kind of having that, having more weight than having the bottom line. Whereas like kind of in, in your childhood, it was kind of about like the bottom line. I want these things. I want this stuff. I want like kind of the quick dollar. I want the quick, I want the quick material shit as fast as I can get it. And then I, I think, I think the original question was at what point do you think you started understanding like, yo, the integrity is, is probably more valuable than the actual you know, like mm -hmm. the, what I'm getting out of this. Um, I don't know if there's an actual point, but I yeah. do know that a very impacting thing that happened to me coming up in the music career is that I would do odd jobs to make enough money to pay for gas to drive to New York. And I would stand in front of record labels, freezing cold, waiting for someone that looked like they worked at a label. Like, hey man, you work here at Universal? And they'd be like, yeah, why, what's up? And you had like 10 seconds to sell Right. why you should be up in their office mm -hmm. and before social media. Um, and when I'd go up in, or I'd get my way into offices and I'd sit and I'd talk to people, this is back with fucking Motorola two-way pagers, and, I, yeah. and I'm sitting there like, yo, listen to this, and I see them just like, like not, listen, like not listening not to me, attention. right? right? Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then I would say things and they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's what's up. I started, literally, my manager can vouch for this, I'd sit there and I'd be like, yeah, you know, I've been working on that. Then I took three dicks in the mouth and it was fucking awesome. And then they'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's what's up. That's what's up. And I'm like, man, let's get the fuck out of here, bro. Because I'm like, they ain't even fucking listening to me. Like, this, is, this is bullshit. And I, remember, I remember thinking how fucking whack that was for them to do that to me or anybody. And I remember thinking I will never do that to somebody else or make anybody feel that like unimportant mm -hmm. as they used to make me feel. And the funny thing is, I won't call out names, but you guys probably know most of the names if I said them. There's a handful of guys that when I was coming up were acting like that. And then when I'm, even recently, like, I don't know if you guys know what I'm doing now, but I'm doing better than I was doing music. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they'll hit me now like, yo, I see you doing this. What's up, man? Like, let's talk. And I'll be like, let me tell you about yourself first. And I tell them, and I'd be like, yo, when I was coming up, this is the kind of dude you were. And I got to school them and give them a lesson and put a mirror in front of their right. face. Oh, not to be a dick or not to shit on them, because I'll never be like, nah, fuck you, you diss me. Because again, going back to, I don't know what their past was. Mm -hmm. I don't know what made them that much of a dick. You yeah. know what I mean? So like, I'm going to give them a pass. If I talk to them and they say they're sorry, or I didn't realize that, or fuck, I made you feel that way, and then they, and they, I open their mind. Well, it's communication, right? That, then yeah. great, we're good to go now. Mm -hmm. if, they, if anybody, which no one did this, but if anyone was like, nah, bro, I didn't do that shit, dad, like, all right, he's unfixable. Right. Yeah. Right, so like. I mean, that's important in business, in any type of business relationship. You need transparency and you need communication, so. Yeah. And you need accountability. Motherfuckers need to be accountable. Awareness. And you need to be transparent about what the fuck happened. I mean, I'll yeah, tell you, Crooked, like, if you did something, I wouldn't be like, man, yo, never, man, fuck Crooked, man. You know what he did? That's not the kind of guy. You know what I am? Me. Yo, Crooked, you know how I feel right now because of what you did? That's what I would do. And I'm going to be like, yo, you're a fucking liar. No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> how, how, do you know how do you know how to say something great? Yeah. I don't know what you're doing, man. You need to go back to robbing my houses like we were as a kid. You ain't robbing me. No, no but I mean, like, if you just keep it real, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, you know, which most people don't. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They mask their feelings or they don't really come all the way transparent what they're, what they're feeling or they're not honest about like the, the good or the bad. Yeah. Like, yeah. They only want to tell each other like, if you guys are all friends and he does something whack, it's your duty as a friend to tell him he's doing something whack. But it's so hard for people to be accountable, especially nowadays. It depends how you approach it. Really? A hundred percent. It's all how you, dude, I could say, let me think about it. You could be like, fuck you. Or you could be like, <laughs> or you could be like, or you could be like, fuck you, man. 
And it's like you're saying the same thing, <laughs> but it's two different ways. And it's like, you'll oh, never, fuck never, you, fuck you, man. <laughs> You've <laughs> done it before. <laughs> yeah. Pause. You feel me? I've done both. I've done both. You've before. done both. Yeah, yeah. What, literally? <laughs> nice way. And you did a pause. <laughs> asshole way. Unpause. Unpause. <laughs> oh, man. No. I, 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 t- I totally get what you're doing. Wait, so what are you doing now? You're doing e game. You're doing e, sh- e stuff, right? With games and. Uh, All right, so let me just get you familiar right? with, with, with the way you're going because you're, you're saying bro. it wrong. Um, so, esports in gaming so okay. a lot of people that are not really used to it or familiar with it will yeah. say like e-gaming and mm-hmm. stuff like that I'm sorry I'm that's, sorry no, sorry, I'm just he's, a, he's a brand new gamer do you not by want the me way? to get you I'm familiar being, I'm being accountable yeah, right? yeah. I'm sorry <laughs> but he just started gaming about two years ago yeah. so he's, he's rather new I started gaming during the pandemic well, you good know? thing for you is I've been getting people familiar forever, so I'll do it again right okay, now. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Hashtag get familiar. Um, so eSports is just like sports. You have structured teams that have managers, that have players, that have contracts, that play in competition to win money and right. win titles. Mm-hmm. Gaming is what you do. Right. Right? So they're two different things. Got it, got it, got it. Right. Okay. Gaming is not eSports. Like phase, eSports like, is gaming. FaZe Clan is eSports, which is basically- They have like, eSports teams. Yeah. eSports teams, right? Yeah. They have esports teams, but they're a gaming organization. Got it, got it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, as, as is Xset and as is 100 So, esports is like kind of like a competitive gaming. It's like the NBA. Right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yep. Professional competitive gaming. Yep. Wow. Like yep. Ninja. And wait, and so, guys. and how long you've been doing that? Since 17. 2017. Yeah, joined FaZe Clan then. They weren't. Uh, they weren't a, a real company or anything. It was just a bunch of popular kids online. So but they're, we, they're by far like they have the biggest crew of gamers. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? They're definitely yeah, so like the Lakers. Even the, now they have the, they're still the biggest, right? Yeah, they are. They're going through some troubles, but yeah, I mean, they'll always, for the history of time, they'll always go down for what, you know, we all did oh, together. They're, they're going through troubles? Yeah. Uh, Google. Yeah. So anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> Come on, gamer, get it together. I didn't want to go no, but, no, but, no, but the founders were a bunch of kids in like 2010 yeah. or 12, and like, you know, they were a bunch of guys that, authentically got together and were doing trick shots and and gaming and became very popular online, but they didn't have a business model. So we came in and created a business model, brought in revenue. They just went to a billion dollar IPO from from zero. So I brought everybody in there from Offset to Pitbull, Swaley, DJ Paul, Yo Gotti, Ray J, Troy Carter, Big Boy, all these people. When did you depart from them? Um, When I launched Xset in 2020. Oh, okay. Yeah. Three years later. Yeah, so I left that, did exit. We got that to a $65 million valuation, became the most diverse and inclusive gaming org. When did you launch that? In like the world. Before or during the pandemic? Uh, July of 20. So during. Oh, wow. During. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So then we launched exit like three years ago. So, so exactly how are you involved? You're, you're, founder. You're, you're, so I'm the founder, founder, VP of business development, but everything. Like, you know, what celebrities do we bring in? What partners do we have? Like the Dre's Las Vegas partnership, building those gaming lounges. I was over there building those gaming lounges. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott to Sway Lee to, you know, T Grizzly to quality control music. Like I'm bringing in all these worlds and these partnerships and these investors. So you're like creating activations, events, partnerships. I'm creating the culture. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a gaming lifestyle brand that we built. So it's just like hip hop. Like you don't have to rap to be part of hip hop. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's the same thing with gaming. You don't have to game to be part of the lifestyle. What made you want to um, get into gaming? Uh, well, at the time, at the time I was vice president of Dash Radio. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And my buddy uh, hit me up and was like, yo, come come over to his office because we, we were working on some, starting some clothing line thing together. He was the former CEO and founder of Karmaloop.com, if you remember that. And by the way, you actually worked at Karmaloop also, right? Well, I did marketing with marketing. them, yeah. So, you yeah, know, Karmaloop was based out of Boston, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So and Greg Selko killed it with that. And then he got the opportunity. So we were going to do something like a new version of Karmaloop. And then he got set up a meeting with somebody who had to do a phase clan, calls me and says, come to our office right now in Hollywood. So I go down there and it was like the boiler room. Everyone's running around. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Mm-hmm. He's like, esports and game. I was like, what is that? So like, neither one of us knew what it was. So I'd spent a couple of days looking at it. I invested that same week, uh, my own money. And then I became the VP of business development that day. And then we collectively brought it to the, the brand it became and raised $40 million and brought all the people I just said and made it 10 times bigger than it was. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, I hear that some like T Grizzly was he just stopped making music because he's making more money gaming at this point. Well, no, T Grizzly still got I mean, he's just dropped a new single, but he um you're right, he is killing it in game. Like I signed him, we made history. I signed T Grizzly inside GTA 
during a game, we built an Exet building and I was an avatar and they came to my building. Grizzly Gang met us in Exet and I signed them in the game. That's crazy. Wow. To Exet. So, but that, but you're also talking to a guy that lowered himself through from a helicopter through the roof to land on my turntables at the Palms. Yeah. <laughs> so like that's that's how I get down, guys. <laughs> hey, like in, in the late 2000s, you were like on the <clears throat> E Entertainment Channel, right? Yeah, from 08 to 13, I was a host on E News. Yeah, and, and that's then, why <clears throat> that's how I became the first resident DJ in Vegas to be on billboards in the back of taxis, and that's how hip hop came to Vegas because of Clint Sparks. Uh, challenge me. About, challenge. I don't know. I don't you know challenge. Oh, man. You challenge oh, man. I don't know about all that. <laughs> you said 08. Yeah, challenge. I don't know, man. I'll try. I don't know. Pull don't out know the right. receipts. Don't know that. Pull, the red flag. Out. Pull out the receipts. You're you the said, first. Uh, wait, what did you say? You were the first of what? DJ to be put on billboards. First resident DJ resident to be DJ. on billboards in the back of taxis. Resident DJ meaning on the back of taxis. Yeah, you know they have them on taxis. Oh, no, no. I think you said the first resident DJ to bring hip hop into Vegas. That was the second thing I said. Yeah. So the second thing I said was, in a major way that had a massive impact, maybe somebody played hip hop before. But I will tell you this, when I came to Vegas in 06 and 07 and tried to, the both clubs I went to were like, we don't play hip hop here. Hip hop isn't a Vegas thing and you're not built for Vegas. I'm standing on the turntables with a microphone, right? So they didn't like any of that shit. Yeah, yeah. So when I got to E, I'm so glad I'm with DJs that are like, like, like right now, like, no, you didn't. We were doing that shit, right? So like, when I went to E in 08, because this is 07 the last time, I think it was the Chateau had a club. Mm -hmm. you remember yeah. that? Chateau, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so I'm, I'm standing on the turntables and the, they turn my mic off. I'm like, what the fuck? And the manager, you know how the managers are out here. Turn his mic off, right? So they turn the mic off. I go, what the fuck? He goes, this ain't, this, this ain't fucking, this is the West Coast, this is Las Vegas, there's no hip hop here. Da, 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 that shit's the East Coast. We don't like people on the mic either. Now I'm not saying no one ever played hip hop before, but what I'm saying is every single Saturday, it was the biggest fucking party in, out here. And it's, that's At undeniable. Like we created the whole, like all the theatrics and everything that went on inside a club from fucking zip lines to fucking all the fucking confetti cannons and balloons and celebrities. Dude, I'll have parties with like Asher Roth, Tony Braxton, Tyrese, Neo, and fucking Paris Hilton on stage with me at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like that was the party every Saturday. Mayweather and Brody Jenner and fucking Ash and fucking Sean Kingston. Next week, Kanye West and Akon and <coughs> Lady Gaga performed at my at my party introducing I mean, her for the first time. I mean, time. it was still, it was going on in the early 2000s and even... Well, yeah, because Vice... Yeah. Look, at first of all... Um, um, I would say like ba even babies had AM. They had like a DJ AM. AM. No, no, yeah. AM was because to me AM was the first DJ uh, like hip hop DJ to get uh, a million dollar contract. Hundred percent. Yeah. AM paved the way for people like me. Right. Mm -hmm. a AM was was mashing up shit, mm -hmm. but not a straight hip hop DJ. But there were there were straight hip hop parties like uh, Shecky. You know Shecky Green. Yep. I yeah. Shecky. Yeah. Record. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So Shecky yeah. was like he was doing what a Thursday Thursday. He was doing, he was actually we was doing Thursdays at light. Yeah. At and it light was all in the Bellagio. And this was, was like in two thousand three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It was still around. Yeah. Cool. It was so like I said, there's a difference from people that play it or a subculture where something's happening to where it's now mainstream and it's a big deal and it's highlighted on billboards right. and promoted on a global network. But, like but I think hip hop was already growing at that time. It Probably. Was and maybe yeah, I was yeah. the guy that like yeah. went like that. And, and I think you were, I think maybe you were the perfect like face, face for it, for yeah. E to the, you know, yeah. to be the perfect face for it. But it was, it was yeah, building. Of course, of course people played hip hop records. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying no one ever played a hip hop record, no. but no one's ever in here like fucking, even though what we do is wrong. And like going into that and fucking all dip set sets and Rockefeller sets in mainstream. I mean, we were doing that. We were doing, yeah, that. We were doing that. <laughs> I was, I was doing well, how about this? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> fucking knew. No, no, no one knew. No, Nobody I think, I think knew. knew. I knew. But you, but you, people <laughs> <laughs> I got motherfuckers familiar. <laughs> oh, no, no. I don't know. I don't You're know. a great promoter. <laughs> no, I give you, I give you the balls to put that on the table. There. Yeah. No, no. no. <laughs> I brought hip hop. Same thing, same thing, same thing with L.A. Nobody came in in L.A. And started I, I'll give you L.A. Oh, man, I'll I'm not going to touch L.A., no, no, man. No, no, I'll, I'll give you L.A. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, by, and by the way, Maybe when I Jamie could say something no, about I'll LA. give him L.A. Wait, wait, but let me, let me, let me change this now, too, just yeah. so you know, especially L.A. Of course it's going to be... I say shit about LA. No, no, no. I'll, of course I'll, it's going to be... He's going to be for L.A. I'm not even going to front. I'm of, not going to sit here and say he didn't do some shit for L.A. Of course there's going to be some hood spots, right? Yeah, 1,000. Now, what I'm saying is what I mean is the same way like E! News. 
of course there's fucking someone talked about hip hop on fucking TV before. There's MTV. Mm-hmm. But when I got to E! News, I made it globally mainstream by bringing the Talib Kweli's and the Pharrell's and all these guys on E! News. They never talked about that shit. If it wasn't Paris or Britney Spears, they weren't talking about it. See, what's funny is when you went on E! News, uh, some of us were like, oh man, he fucking he he turned out. his he back on hip hop. Yeah, he sold out. Funk Flex and them used to call me the Tom Cruise of hip hop. <laughs> 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 but wait, how can I turn my back when I'm the one helping introduce us to a new audience? I mean, but yeah, I feel like you were, it was just like kind of you're like. The, you're, the, you're the cowboy that went over the hill. No, so it's kind of like, hey, we need like uh, someone to, like hip hop's really popping right now. Like we're, I'm just imagining the boardroom meeting. Like hip hop's really popping popping right now. We need like a friendly face to kind of represent ball? the shit mm-hmm. on here. And then, but we're not going to use a person of color. We're going to use like a, a friendly, good looking, like uh, post a poster boy white guy yeah. that we can that, sell it to and that that yeah. very is why there's a lot of problems in the world right because those kind of assumptions that are, couldn't be further from the truth mm-hmm. is what creates well, yeah, that's what I mean. we, and we, then we, fucking yeah. problems right well, but that's what we were thinking so we're like yo this motherfucker kind of sold out he was mm-hmm. making hood ass mixtapes and now he's on E! News and now I'm introducing him to E! News he's, he's getting that money <laughs> <Yeah>. right <laughs> he's getting no so, so he he's, making, he's getting that E! money he ain't doing that hood shit so here's the real story now that'll make you say damn I was fucking wrong yeah yeah, let's do it. All right, so it's not the same Vegas story that you were saying to us. This is this is real. This is this yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, okay. it's, 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 it's equally as real as the Vegas thing. All right, ready? So, um, so a girl, this girl named Baz Baz that worked at Arista, she was like, "Hey, can you come to New York for my boyfriend who's doing a conference for I forget what the college trade magazine was at the time?" And I was like, "Yeah, of course, whatever you need." So she like, "Cool." Then I end up getting a, a call from Paul Rosenberg, who's like, yo, M's coming mm-hmm. to Boston. Uh, we, we got a show at the, at the Garden. Uh, we want to bring you out. And I was like, what day? And he tells me the day, and it's the same day as I'm going to, I already promised to do New York. Mm-hmm. So I call back, but I was like, hey, man, I got this opportunity. Will, will your boyfriend, Ben, uh, Lyons, be mad if I don't go? She's like, oh, my God, you'll break his heart. He's a big fan. This is, you, can't, you can't back out. He's basing it around you. So... I right, fuck it. I, don't, I, I stick to my word and I don't do the thing with M. So then the day comes, I got to go to New York and it's a blizzard. I got to fucking drive to New York in a blizzard. First of all, I'm like, who the fuck's even going to come in a blizzard? Second of all, I got to drive five hours in a blizzard. So I drive all the way there and it was me, Kid Capri, and uh, Just Ski. We were the three DJs oh, wow. on the panel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was like five people in the audience, right? But I went there, did it, act like it was the most important thing treated Ben like he was the most important guy and uh, you know we hung out and then that was that then fast forward three months later I get a call from this guy Ben and he goes "Um, hey would you ever want to uh, talk music on E! News like I do movies because he was the movie critic Mm -hmm. on E! News his dad's you know Jeffrey Lyons the famous New York film critic oh shit I didn't I didn't know that yeah Um, so I was like what do you mean like I literally said like Britney Spears Paris Hilton Hollywood E! and he was like yeah I was like uh, I don't know. Because I, like you, I was thinking, what the fuck would that have to do with me yeah. and what I'm doing, right? So then he was like, yeah. I was like, oh. oh. Then I thought, oh, maybe this is a way that I can bring hip hop to that platform. Uh-huh. So I was like, all right, cool. So I flew out there. Then I was going to get an interview. I went straight on the air. Uh, then I did it again the second week. Then the third week, I'm on the air three weeks in a row. I'm like, am I getting hired? So like, that's how I got the job. One, from being a man of my word and sticking to going to do that thing for Ben, even when I had the opportunity to go at Eminem. And then two, this guy who's a real hip hop head, like legit hip hop head from New York, was a fan of mine and hip hop. And was like, fuck, who do I know that I can get to come on here and promote and bring hip hop to E! News? So that's how that really happened. Mm. And then you were there for how long? Five years. Five years. Yeah, because I remember at the time, I mean, because we, look, Nevin and I have been doing clubs. He's been doing it since the late 90s. I've been doing it since like the 2000s. 2000s. So we were in the New York club scene. We're both from New York. Okay. And then we came to Vegas probably in the mid 2000s. You a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. 2003. Um, yeah, 2003. Mm-hmm. And so that we know about the whole club scenes, but mm-hmm. the mixtape, we were kind of following you two at the same time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then. You know, at that time, there was kind of like more, there was a clear separation. There was like radio DJs, yeah, club you know, DJs, club mixtape DJs, DJs. And mixtapes. So like when you started doing clubs in Vegas, we were like, oh, this is dope. And it was the whole E thing. We're like, okay, like he went to get a bag, you know, he kind of turned his, we felt like, oh, maybe like, you know, he's like, he's, he's going like the, the Hollywood route, you know? 
And then I think you started making like EDM songs. So we were like, oh, he he completely like he's like <laughs> fuck fuck hip hop. You know what I'm saying? This is dope to hear he from he like colleagues. He abandoned <clears throat> hip hop. Yeah, no, no, but see, <laughs> but this is the time when a but lot. Wait, of- can I? I gotta point something out. Hold that thought. Yeah. Because let me just tell you how fucking ahead I was of all you motherfuckers. Wait, wait, but did, let me finish this. Because right. at the time with club DJs, yeah. there was a line in the sand where it was like, oh, if you're a hip hop DJ or if you're a uh, mashup or open format, the open format term didn't exist at that time. Mm. But they were like, you're, if you're hip hop or are you a house DJ? And everyone's right. like, they're looking for EDM DJs. Right. So a lot of these hip hop DJs were like, oh, I'm fucking, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a jump on the EDM I'm, I'm, wagon. I'm going to switch it up. I'm going yep. to switch it up. Yep. They, they, they tried to market themselves totally. as EDM guys and yep. stuff. And so we were just like, oh, shit, Clint Sparks doing that shit now, right. too. So we are like, he's jumping on that wagon as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. And then when hip hop came back, I don't know, five or so years later, mm-hmm. these motherfuckers couldn't, like, they were trying to remarket themselves as hip hop motherfuckers again. And it was just like, oh shit, these like kind of flipping, mm-hmm. flippity flopping and vacuuming, you know, yeah. whatever. Well, yeah, yeah. Two things. One, yeah. when you're a business, that's called moving with the market so that you can survive and still sell whatever product you're selling, uh, if you're thinking at it from a business point of view. But secondly, uh, I'll tell you why I did it. And I didn't follow the trend, I was the trend, and I'll tell you how. Uh, when I was on Shade 45, which is arguably the hardest fucking hip hop station For out. sure, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So like, I'm on there, and I'm like, we started getting into the snap rap era. Right, and I'm so used to coming in with my sets. If you guys ever heard me on Shade 45, I come in fucking shutting the building down. Yeah, and like, and I'm like, fuck all this. Burn, burn, burn. Burn, burn. I'm like this shit is weak as fuck right and this is at the time when I d- signed DJ Snake so I'm going overseas a lot mm-hmm. as a DJ but then even with Snake so I'm listening to music over there like I'm like this is fucking hard as shit and it's giving me that aggression that I'd feel when you're playing fucking Dipset or G-Unit or CNN or Mob Deep mm-hmm. that I wasn't getting anymore at hip hop it wasn't filling my like anymore in hip hop yeah, yeah. so when, yeah. I go, when I go over there I'd hear that shit I'm like give me fucking more of that so I went home and I'm the guy that slowed it down to go D block I put Big Sean Rick Ross G unit all these motherfuckers on up on EDM and house music before it even got here so I'm going to their studios and their houses and I'm like yo rock rock on this and they'd be like yo what? And I, at first I was playing at the 128 yeah. and they were like nah so then I'd slow it down to like 80 right and then they'd be like yo this shit is fucking hard some of them I had to trick them and put them on a regular beat and then switch it to a slow down electronic record mm-hmm. then when I'd play it back to them they'd be like what the fuck and then I remember I went to Steve Aoki and I was like, yo, check this out. And he listened to it. He goes, damn. And to your point, I look at you to see what's hot in hip hop. You're doing this now? And I was like, this is what's going to be next that's hot in hip hop. And what came next that was hot in hip hop? Trap. EDM and dubstep and with hip hop and all the rappers got involved with it. I was three years ahead of that shit. I don't know if that was hip hop, but I think it was like whatever, pop music. Yeah, sure, whatever you music, want to call yeah. it. It was hip hop mixed with EDM. It was hip hop artists performing on EDM. Yeah, everybody was doing it. Kid Cudi is a rapper. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had what's a the biggest EDM the song yeah. that you play today? Still, you know what I'm saying? It's hip hop. You're saying Kid Cudi's not hip hop? Oh, that was a remix. Yeah, that was an EDM it's hip-hop. remix. Yeah. It's hip hop. Yeah, it's if you're being like a purist hip hop head right now. I'm not being a purist of hip hop. All right, so the, but the elements of yeah. hip hop that was another another chapter of hip hop, which we've gone through many throughout hip hop. Whether it was like you know being conscious rap, whether it being you know gangster rap, it went through different things. All that was was a different sound of the music. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? And if you don't accept that, then you're not accepting the evolution of hip hop that got us back to here. No, no, I mean you can. I think we can see it as an evolution, definitely. I, I think it can. I think it's more of an evolution of pop music, and I think m- hip hop is. A so part then of that pop means hip hop is too, because that's what's pop now is hip hop. No, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think you have a point. I, I mean, is a track not hip hop? David Guetta and Snake were hip hop DJs. Mm-hmm. You know, they're hip hop, right? Are they yeah. not hip hop because they play EDM? I think, like you said, like there's culture and there's business. Mm. And I think there's there's a, a separation in the two. See, I don't, I don't, I never got caught up in the separating. Just whatever's dope is dope, 
right? So I was never like, oh, that ain't real. Oh, da da da. Even like when the SoundCloud rapping started and everyone, like 2015, old heads and young heads are button heads and everyone's like, ah, oh, there's mumble rap. That's da da da. It's like, no, it's not. It's a new way of expressing that these fucking guys figured out that's dope to them. And you fucking fighting it means you're an old fucking dinosaur that doesn't understand or appreciate or respect you know, experimenting or doing new shit. Yeah, but it's also the same thing of you saying like snap music is like, oh, this is like weird hip hop, but like, yo, this EDM has that same aggression energy. Do you know what I'm saying? But it's no, just I different. It's, it's not just for me. Different. I it's said not I wasn't for you. doing yeah. it for me. I didn't it say it's not hip hop. I still celebrate oh, yeah, for sure. it as an era of hip hop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, I think, I think for, for club, as a club DJ, it was very apparent what was like obvious club music with Guetta getting Nicki Minaj on a record or mm -hmm. Usher on a record. Mm -hmm. That was a bag. Everyone's trying to get a bag, right? Yep. Sure. I don't know if that's necessarily to push hip hop forward. Do you know what I'm saying? It's everyone capitalizing. It's labels capitalizing, producers capitalizing, even rappers capitalizing off of opportunities and money of what's and visibility and presence and what's hot at the moment. So... I think, do I consider that like hip hop culture? If you want to say, well, part of the music industry, it's part of the music industry, yeah. But I don't think like if you talk about hip hop, I don't think motherfuckers like, you know, when I go back to New York, if I was going to Harlem or if I went to like my old block or even if I went to certain parts of LA, that they were necessarily rocking some of that shit on the streets or anything like that. Let me, ask, let me put it this way. But, that, but that's why to me, what happened after the EDM era and what, what emerged in New York and what emerged LA. in LA was the resurgence of this new hip hop sound with Mustard. And then you had like uh, Bobby Schmurder, mm -hmm. you had French Montana, you had all these motherfuckers coming out. And Two to chains. me, that's hip hop. I think the EDM, sec the EDM portion that you're talking about, you know, I think it had hip hop artists in there, but I wouldn't consider it hip hop. There's elements of hip hop in it, but I don't think it's like, necessarily a hip-hop culture i think it was 100 percent an opportunity to like package and sell and be like oh these are big artists and how can i get more visibility on these songs and have it cross over to all markets but i do agree like that i think it's pop music but i don't necessarily think like hip-hop like it's hip-hop you know what i mean we felt like we were abandoned a little bit for me yeah damn sorry guys <laughs> <laughs> you, no, no. I no, feel well, like, what I, let me tell you what I what I was attempting right. to do. Right, and I think I succeeded was stretch the boundaries of what a DJ can be. Mm -hmm. And I think like at that time, the most a DJ was was maybe a host on MTV, right? And like mm -hmm. they weren't they weren't building themselves as brands. They weren't stretching the boundaries. And they weren't touching audiences that wouldn't typically listen to hip hop. And if I was, as you say, the safe way to be introduced to something, mm -hmm. so be it. If I get to introduce you to it. And to your point, listen, I agree with you because I, I believe everybody's point of view is right. Right. Because it's right for them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to debate which what's more real, what's more hip hop, because it's whatever's good to you is great to you. You do you. Who, who are we to argue? Like, all, I know, sure. all I know is I am fucking hip hop. So if I do something, it's hip hop. Because I am hip hop. Just like if you're Asian and you mm -hmm. do something, an Asian did it, regardless what it is. You're an Asian at the core of who you are, so an Asian did this. I'm hip hop to the core. So if I play a fucking guitar, that's a hip hop guy playing a guitar. That's how I look at it. It doesn't mean I'm not hip hop anymore because I played a guitar, because I am hip hop. Does that yeah, make yeah. sense? No, no. So that's what I meant by it. And now I'm totally aware of the, the abuse and the commercialization and labels saying, let's jump on this bandwagon. Well, we all know that shit. We all know the good from the whack. Yeah, yeah, we all yeah. know the attempt from like, ah, oh, this is another fucking whack 128 and they put a rapper on it. We all know that. We all were able to pick out, we all would know like, ah, oh, this one's dope. Right? Oh, this one's fucking trash. So like we all agree as DJs like what's good music and what's not. But as far as like what satisfies yourself or feeds your need in, you know, uh, affection with with music is subject to your own personal taste and opinion so like i don't discredit snap rap at all it's a part of hip-hop forever and yeah. for sure it just the, the wasn't funny thing is it's the most it's probably one of the most besides like uh, new orleans the new orleans bounce yeah it's probably one of the most prevalent sounds that are still relevant now yeah. in the people clubs. are redoing it now yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and mm -hmm. like and like look and i and i play it too but like i'm just saying at the time mm -hmm. for my show on shade 45 yeah, yeah. it was empty for like hard because i come on like boom, 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 sirens all that let me give you another thing i'll challenge where do you think where do you think all the radio DJs on mix shows came up with all the theatrics and sound effects and punching their name through their song? 
I'm, I'm gonna, you're gonna say, <laughs> you're gonna say it came from Clint it's Clint Sparks. Get familiar. It's Clint Sparks. <laughs> It was not Clint Sparks. The only person, or only Clint, person. I don't know. No, I don't know what's going on at this point. It was <laughs> Funk Flex yeah. was playing bombs. Yeah, but all the. Wasn't they doing that? Uh, but okay, wasn't they doing that LA radio, Jamie? Yeah, because I, I I remember, man, I do remember people. Were you doing the first it. to do gunshots in, in a mixtape? No, because that's the best sound effect of all time. That's one of my favorite. favorite. <laughs> was it the Street Sweeper? Was it K Slay? I, it was all like I don't know who the first because we all were kind of doing. Yeah, yeah, we were doing. It. I don't know who the first. Case yeah, yeah, yeah. Slay. I wouldn't be surprised if it was Rest Case Slay. Rest in peace, Case Slay. Yes. Wow. Yeah, Slay's the man. You'll be. You're, you're, he's not only the hip hop Gary V, but he's like the like the white soldier boy. He's like <laughs> it's all started for me. <laughs> <laughs> this Vegas shit started for me, and I did all the, the hey, radio. Good, the good thing about so, soldier, he's right most of the time. <laughs> 80 percent you know wait so you're saying you started all the radio theatrics of uh that like the sound effects or or the or you mean the club even like punching your name at the beginning of your beats mm -hmm. nobody was doing that clint sparse giga get familiar was at the beginning of all my beats people used to tell me to take it off mm, i'm so, trying to remember I mean, but you might be right i am right dude i've been around wait, wait, hip hop. No, i know what the fuck. Slade was doing that on the radio no, oh, his radio show. I'm talking about like like mustard like on the beat, like, like, yeah, like no one had like, like tagline. No one had poisoned their beats. If like you, I was like doing. he's saying like if Young Metro don't shoot you, yeah, that, that intro stuff, mm -hmm. right? I'm, yeah, I well, can't. I can't think of. Well, it's gonna. It's, no, <laughs> it's I, gonna go out there. Someone's gonna get so, mad. I know. No, or someone's gonna good. double down and say no, he's right. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. <laughs> I love that. From what I remember, it was you. It was a get familiar the girl, the girl voice. But then it was also the heavy hitters. Like every time, heavy, heavy hitters, heavy tucker, hitters, tucker. But um, it was those two taglines. But I can't fucking recall. Well, who it, did it, it had first. to start from a DJ because it's a DJ. Yeah, drop. it's it's, it's gonna. It's be essentially a DJ or, yeah. drop, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I would say even more back in the day, I would have to say maybe it I wasn't mean, a, it wasn't a drop. But I give props to Pete Rock as one of the first producers to like say his name on a fucking track. Rapping, yeah, yeah but that's, well, no, that's just to say amp. another Pete Rock right. remix, like remix, yeah. just to even acknowledge yeah. that, like to say a producer's name on a yeah. track was yeah, like yeah. Pete Rock. And then Diddy kind of like yeah, started. I was say, mm -hmm. And then if there was no P Rock, there wouldn't be a Diddy talking. Nah, there was Marley Mall. Yeah. Like there was nah, there was fucking Scott LaRock. Like this D Nice fucking made a whole song with his name in it. And he produced it and wrote it and rapped it. But nah, like to, to say that to be like the producers were always quiet and to come out yeah. at the end and be like another P Rock Ma, remix. Lay Ma. Like, you, you never really know who, who the produced Ma, the record. Lay Ma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole fucking song is there. But is then he would them. also ad lib on the songs. He'd be yeah. like talking in the background. Mm -hmm. yeah. I I gotta give it to P Rock. I think you know you might I, say you're Marley onto Ball. something. I think because I had I had Jermaine Dupri on my show recently. I said, "Who came up with like talking behind the records first? You or Puff?" It was Jermaine. Jermaine said him right, but I think he's right. I think it's P no, Rock. P Rock. P Rock. Yeah, was, definitely. Was, but P Rock was just kind of like nonchalant and every now like, and then. And it wasn't like his in, thing. Yeah, yeah. This is like in '91, '92. Yeah. So I yeah, would yeah. say definitely P Rock. Yeah, because, yeah, because that's when I yeah, yeah. that's when that's I really yeah. wanted to be. I wanted to be like a producer because I'm like, oh shit, we can say our names. How would I say my name in the beginning of a, my own remix? Uh -huh. How would I do the ad libs? Because like, he would be on the ad libs sometimes, just talking in the background. Yep. And shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but by the way, just so we're clear, I didn't say I was the first person to say my name in, in mixes. <laughs> in mixes. I said all the theatrics. Theatrics. All, right. all the sirens and the planes going by and the sound effects and punching Shoot. your name and. All that shit. <laughs> and making my shit sound like it was echoing before we had machines that did that. Really? Yeah. No, Desert Storm had to do the echoing shit. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to touch this. I don't want to go. No, Dude, no storm, not my storm, storm, voice. Storm, storm, storm. I'm not talking about my voice echoing. You, I'm talking? talking about the effects and the shit that I'm doing. Oh, Bro, okay. no one could even that. believe I was doing the shit I was doing live until they came that. and seen me. I'm I had a, I had turntables. A uh, keyboard, a sample, a sampler, an instant replay, yeah. all that shit. Nobody, nobody was doing that say, shit. Once again, K State was doing the jail cell um, closing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. All in all, who has the greatest? I think that might be one of the greatest. I think so. Yeah, yeah that might be. <laughs> hey, I have a question. In Boston, when you were when you were popping, you're doing. Did you ever have to deal with Benzino? <gasps> That's a good question. Uh, no, Ray was always a, a good dude to me. We always really? had a great relationship. Yeah, yeah. There was this one story that's interesting. Um, 
And I just seen him recently too. Like I'm super happy with where he's gone with his life. But um, it's funny because I mean, his daughter's killing it, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I people don't know like how big Benzino was a fucking big deal. He was shook. He was shook. Yeah, 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 right? Yeah. So like, yeah, but people. I was really, I was kind of curious because you were blowing up so much. I wonder if if he was like if you had to kind of like you know kind of show him love like you know like yo like show well, I, respect I, mean, to I, sh- him. I show love and respect to anybody every way anyways and yeah, i think yeah. the only time people kind of press up on you is when like you're an asshole mm. or or like you know you think you're better than everybody or yeah, something yeah. you know what i mean that's when they got something to prove but i always got respect in the hood because i always respected the hood because i'm from the hood mm-hmm. you know what i mean i always looked out for people and i always treated everybody well and, and the same so i never had any issues like that um but there was one time i got summoned uh to go see uh ray dog that was his name in ray Boston. Dog. yeah wow. um and they were like yo he wants to see you so i had to go to this uh studio what were you like were you like carrying groceries and then a van pulled up and they no like, i don't remember <laughs> no it wasn't nah. <laughs> yeah, was i didn't good. get snatched <laughs> Ray Dog needs to see you. Yeah. My milk. Well, what about my grocery? <laughs> the fuck your grocery. Uh, no, no. I, I, Just I pulled up in my now. <laughs> fuck that. <laughs> I pulled up in my own car. So it was like an industrial park, and they had yeah. a studio in the back, and it, you know, it was you know, you walking in like these dudes are all playing video games. And you went dolo. Weed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I walked down here. These guys are doing whatever. Then I walked down a long hallway, and we went to his studio. And then uh, he was like, "Sparks, I want to play you some records, and let me know what you think about them." So, like I said, I'm always honest. As a matter of fact, about shit. So I'm like, "Fuck, man, I hope they're good, right?" <laughs> so um, he plays a couple records, and then I give him my opinion on what could be better. What year what, is this? What year is this? Fuck, I don't. Early. Was this when he dropped that single? The do do where the party at? What it, was it? Might have been. Song? It was around then. Yeah, that yeah. was like 2003. What well, was the song? Was it where the party? Uh, rock the party. Yeah. Rock the party. Scott Storch wasn't yeah. did he do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, I still remember. I think I still have that record. It's white. So white, just black letters. Um, anyway, so they call me and I say what I think about it. And it wasn't like the best feedback, uh, but it was the honest feedback and the right yeah, feedback yeah. for what he should be doing. Yeah. And I, the room got fucking, the tension was like, I'm just, I'm waiting. Because all you hear about is like people just getting beat down. So, I, hear right? ch- ch- I didn't hear that, but I was, I'm just, I, I literally thought to myself, all right, I have to get a beat down now. This yeah. is going to be like five, <laughs> five dudes that you are going to say calmly like you were accepting. In my over. mind, I'm just like, all right, I'm going to get like, a beat you're down. You're like, I'm punching that dude and I'm Fuck kicking it. this the, guy. No, no, no. The beat down is inevitable at this point. <laughs> yes. I got to just take it. Just get it over with. <laughs> Uh, there's nothing I can do. At he this like point. took off his hat. He took off his chain. He's just like yeah, taking what? his rings off. You think <laughs> I sh- what are you doing? You think I showed up with a chain? <laughs> <laughs> I would have. I would have showed up with a shooter. Yeah, I, I would have had somebody around the corner. I would have yeah. had someone with some on him. For yeah. I've I've never I've walked a lot of places by yeah. myself. Like I just I don't know if it's naivety or just like I just. So you're not even caring when you went to see Benzie? No, no. Oh, like, you weren't a little nervous. I'm like twenty. I don't know. Twenty three. Like I, I mean, know. you were robbing people. I would assume. Like, you, <laughs> <laughs> not yeah, that, was that was the past. That was the past. Though. Yeah, um, yeah I would have been like, "Yo, I'm gonna go see." Ben I brought, I brought some that. throwing darts. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What was uh, his response? Uh, so that's what I was getting to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so then this like, we pause, and he just kind of looks up, and he does like this. Which, which I'm, I'm thinking, I'm translating to like, you done fucked how, up. The, how the fuck are we going to hurt this dude, right? That's what I'm thinking. Should I hurt uh, this dude? Right? Yeah. And then he just goes, and he looked at me, he goes, I respect that, Sparks. I respect that. You want something to eat? And I was like, ah, oh, fucking thank goodness. But like, we've been cool ever since. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but like, I've always had respect for, you know, what he's built, what he's done. And then like, you know, Made Man and Jeff, Jeff two times a DJ I'm good friends with yeah, yeah. over the years. So... I mean, yeah, it's always been cool. Even when he started Hip Hop Weekly and, you know, he'd come to Dash and, yeah. I w- how was the music? Was it like an album? I don't remember. I don't even remember what he played me. I just I think he played like two or three records. Oh, okay. Uh. Wow. I mean, that's 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 good that you were honest with the, you know. Yeah. At least, at least you didn't like soup I mean, them up. A lot, so, I feel some like a lot like, of motherfuckers would have souped them up. Get with cast his ass up. Like, so, oh, man, this shit is bad, <laughs> man. Yo. Oh, yeah, you know, most motherfuckers would. Yeah. And he's like, you gonna put it on your next tape? You're like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that. I had enough songs for the next I wouldn't be surprised if that was asked, actually. <laughs> that would be like a common thing to say. Like, can you put this on your next well, tape? Well, it would be your feedback. Because if it was semi good, he would be like, yo, can you put it on your tape? Probably. And I probably right? would have been like, yo, let's make these changes, da da da, this, this, and that. You would have helped them out to make the song better. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
I have a question for you. Uh, right. What what route did you do that drama oh, didn't do that led him to end up being incarcerated for all the mixtape shit? Uh, I wasn't as big and popular as him. Oh, okay. Because I was wondering. I'm so like, it's more like what route did I not do? Yeah. That, so that, what route did you do that he did? But I will tell you this that no one knows except drama um, that we, I was next. Oh, so the, okay. my lawyer called me at Mix Unit and said, do X, Y, and Z right now. I'll call you later. So I hung up. And then later on, I found out we were going to get raided and the feds were going to do us. But my lawyer is a big dog. So he was at, I guess Interscope had something to do with what was going to happen to me. So he stopped it. And then he called me the next day. He, was, he told me this whole story. He's like, you guys were going down. You were about to be a rap. Yeah, because Jimmy Iovine was looking for motherfuckers at that point. I don't know. I don't really? know about that. Yeah, he was, he, was, he was looking for, he was trying to take down everybody after Napster. So mm-hmm. he was after all the counterfeit and all the like illegal shit. He was I feel like they shit. really did And that. if you're saying Interscope was part of the dude, I mean, it's only him. That, mm-hmm. in, the, in the Defiant Ones, it shows that. You know, what's, you know what sucks is that I was talking to Drama recently and we were like, because like, there's kind of a resurgence of mixtapes and people mm-hmm. are looking for, I get hundreds of DMs a week of like, yo, where's this mixtape? Where's this? This but is my mi- favorite. Mix, mixunit.com is still going. I right? have nothing to do with that. I, haven't, have I haven't since for over a decade. Because I, I looked at it and it's they're still moving it's mixtapes. Yeah. They got the, yeah. n- the new uh, Uzi Vert on there. Yeah, and they got crazy. the, the mixtapes. Like I got nothing to do with that. Six ninety nine for a download. God damn. That's but none of, us, none of us like archived or saved the sessions of our mixtapes. Uh, yeah. So none of us like have like... You don't have masters or anything? Nope. You wow. know, it's funny. Cornerstone just hit me the other day. Fader Magazine. Oh, I wow. Mean. Cornerstone. So Fader hit me. That was me. the number one, yeah. yeah. Back in the day. Fader is doing for uh, Hip Hop's 50th anniversary, they're doing something with Apple with all... Do you guys remember the Cornerstone mixtapes? Yeah. 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 Right? Yep. So I did a bunch of those. One, some of the best packaging ever. Yeah, yeah it was. Mm-hmm. So yeah. me, Green, Mark Ronson, a yeah. lot of us did I just plays. Mm-hmm. So I guess they're doing something with Apple and in August they're re-releasing those through Apple. Apple and they called to get my permission. Oh, that's to oh, okay. really? no, finally, yeah. goddamn! Yeah, because yeah. yeah, yeah. I would wish like like the Drought Three, Little Wayne, that should be in the Wait, fucking. So your catalog of mixtapes, the hundred plus mixtapes that you've made, right? It's not found anywhere online. Like people, no, can't there's a bunch. Them. Yeah, they you can, can adapt here for whatever those, whatever sites. You can probably find dozens of them. Wow. Uh, but there's a lot that's not because I didn't really get down with. Remember, to, to them, I'm the enemy. I'm mix unit, so they ain't going to support my shit. Yeah. But probably later on, they probably were like, all right, let's just upload his shit. But at the time, they wouldn't because they're looking at me as competition. But do you, do you have, like, let's say someone wanted to have your whole catalog and kind of repost their putting on streaming apps. Mm-hmm. I mean, would you be able to access them somehow? Well, yeah, I have them. Yeah, yeah. But, and, I can di- and a lot of them are digitized, but you couldn't do that. It's, it's too many, it's too much legalities to get them cleared. Right. Yeah. There's it's too, many too many artists, instrumentals, too many things. Yeah, yeah it's too much. You'd need fucking 6,000 clearances for one mixtape. Yeah, because like every mixtape had like, what, like 20 songs or some shit. It was packed. But then even mine, like I'm switching beats, taking yeah, this, yeah. taking a verse from that, a, a chorus from that, some words from here, making a new chorus, like... Just so much. Yeah. Who's a who's your favorite, like kind of artist of all time? Artist? Like, yeah, that was on your mixtapes. On my, and you like, just wanted them on all. You just like kept having them on. And, like he was a must have every mixtape. Or oh, you know who was, was on go-to? probably every single one of my mixtapes from the beginning? Cardinal Official. Mm. Oh, shout out to Cardinal. Yeah, from the T dot. You know yeah. he's a host on Canada's Got Talent now. Oh, is he? Yeah, he's right next to Howie Mandel. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's having a big resurgence right now too. Dangerous was a huge record yeah. Yeah. last year again, and then he's he's doing a lot. He's getting all the love and respect that he deserves. Like how Busta's going through this, yeah, kind of giving him his flowers. Cardi's kind of going through that too. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's that's crazy. Cardi, huh? Yeah. He was just nasty. He could rap. He could do dance hall. He could. Do you know everything. what's funny? When when me and K Slave made we made an epic mixtape together called uh, Kill Yourself fucking epic mixtape right and I remember saying let's put Cardinal on this song he's like man I don't know what the fuck that guy is I don't know if he's Jamaican if he's a rapper if he's reggae like I don't know what the fuck he is <laughs> it was just so funny I'm like no, he's a rapper bro yeah but I don't even understand half the shit he says you know Case Slay was awesome like we were really good friends and we had like a unique kind of like uh, I don't know who to compare it to but like you know white guy that jokes like not too manly and straight, straight. K. Slay was like straight, street, street sweeper, right? Yeah. So like whenever we're together, it's funny because we're like two different worlds, but we get along so well. Uh-huh. And uh, even when we did that mixtape, 
I kept, um, and this goes to show like perseverance, right? So I, I drove to New York and I was, cause I said, let's do a mixtape together. Mm -hmm. So he's like, all right, come meet me. So I go there, I'm waiting, I'm gonna tell the short version of it. Um, I'm waiting outside for him, he doesn't show up. I wait 24 hours, he doesn't show up. I wait the next day, he's not showing up, responding to me. Goes live on the air, doing his show. I'm like, well, he's fucking here, he's on the radio. After the show, I'm hitting him up, he doesn't respond. I hang out for 48 hours in my car, slept in my car. He didn't fucking respond, I go home. My friend's like, man, make a diss tape against him. I'm like, no, that's not part of my plan. And they're like, no, nah, but he made you wait. And I go, it doesn't fucking matter. My plan is to get this done. Yeah. Right? I go, his priority is not the same as mine. So I, I hit him a week later as if nothing happened. Yo, Slay, what up, bro? He's like, yo, what's up, man? When we doing that tape? Right? Now, the average motherfucker would be like, man, I waited for you last week. Why would I do that? Right? So... I go there again, he says, come out here. I end up waiting again like 24 hours. Um, I, I pull up on him in front of his house as he's walking into his building. I'm like, yo, Slay, jump in the car. He's like, what is this, what is this? Like jo joking around. I go, jump in the car, I got an idea. So I bring him to the middle of Central Park. And he goes, man, where the fuck we going? Ain't no lights out here. Man, it ain't fucking good out here, man, for me to be doing this shit, right? And uh, you know how you guys know Slay like that? Like that's, he's fucking awesome. So we get there and I go, all right, get out of the car. And he goes, man, what the fuck y'all trying to do, man? I'm like, no, just fucking trust me, Slade. Just jump out. So we jump out. I put my friend in the trunk, a white guy, in the trunk with a camera. I say, here, put this shirt on. He puts the shirt on. I go, here, hold this shovel. Right? And I go, now put your hand on the trunk. And he goes, man, I'm a fucking black guy out here with a white dude in the trunk holding a fucking shovel. If the cops come, I'm going to fucking jail. And I'm like, don't worry, you're with me. Right? So then he goes, so then he, so he's like, man, fucking sparks, what the fuck you got me doing? So I'm like, so I go, I go, you ready? He goes, yeah, ready. I go, I make a face, he do it, get the picture, I jump back in the car. We go home, I go up into his house, I go, here, read this script. Have him read the script. I got right, PC in a week. Go home, I put the whole shit together put his vocals on it, make the cover. If you go look at the cover, it's Kill mm. Yourself, Clinton Spars and Casey. You could probably pull it up right now yeah, and see yeah. what it looks like. You see it? Oh yeah, I'm definitely right. gonna add it to the, yeah, and, the episode. Right, so you see it, and that's us in the middle of the night in Central Park, and that's me getting that done. <laughs> but let me, let, me, let me tell you the benefit of not getting emotional and like being mad at him or reminding him that he dissed me, which by the way, that's never a fucking smart thing to remind somebody that you're doing, trying to do business with. Like, you dissed me before. It's fucking awkward, right? So he... Goes on Hot 97, plays the entire mixtape. Clinton Sparks' name was shouted like 60 times in New York City on Hot 97. Big shout out Clint Sparks, produced by Clint Sparks, brand new Clint Sparks. You couldn't fucking pay for that kind of promotion. And that just goes to show when you just fucking do the right thing, get the job done and stay focused and don't let your emotions get involved, mm -hmm. you're always gonna fucking win in the end. Yeah. And we had an incredible relationship, man, all the way up until his unfortunate passing. Yeah. Rest, in, Rest peace. in peace. Rest in peace, man. You've done so much. Are you like you even went on tour with Diddy, right? I was Diddy's tour DJ. Yeah. Was that during the E E time or was that a little uh, bit before? That was um the um, press, press play, play right? Tour, That's yeah, 07, yeah. 07, 06, 07? That was like yeah, he was still doing hip hop. Oh, you really know what? Week. I did just start E because I have a, there's something online where I'm interviewing him, and as I ask him a question, he goes. It is so fucking hilarious being interviewed by you. And the reason he said that is because <laughs> we're like together every day. Uh, but, how, long, uh, how long was that tour for? I don't remember, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing that I've never said before, and this it'll be interesting to be on this show since DJs listen. Um, so that was probably the most stressful thing I've ever done in my entire life. Wow. Except my divorce. Oh, um, fuck, Jesus. It was, it was, I mean, dude, it was like, what the fuck is going on? Does anybody know anything? Like, Puff, can you fucking make up your mind? Like, why are you like, like, I'll do something super dope and he'll look back and be like, yeah, the next day I do the same cut. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? You're supposed to be the greatest DJ around. I'm like, I am the fucking greatest DJ. This shit is fucking dope. It was dope yesterday. It's still dope today. Yeah. And like, we have a little back and forth every now and then. And then um, when, when that leg of the tour ended and they were going overseas, they were like, all right, yo, we're ready to go on this next leg. I was like, nah, I can't do it. And they're like, why? And I was like, you know what? You should call D-Nice. D-Nice would be great at doing this. Because at that time, D-Nice was a photographer. And I knew he loved taking pictures. Mm -hmm. So I was like, if he gets that gig over there, he'll be able to take oh. awesome fucking pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I never even told D-Nice this. I don't even know if D-Nice knows this until maybe he hears this or someone tells him now from hearing this. I'm the reason D-Nice ended up being P. Diddy's store DJ. Well, I didn't even know that. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> I don't think he'll hear this though. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, forward it, we'll forward it to him. We'll try. <laughs> Somebody, there's going to be some DJ that listens. We've been trying to get him on. Yeah. Yeah, he, we would try. He's, he's definitely not listening. He's DJing in the moon but bro, these days. 
I was like, yo, I was like, yo, we was like trying to hit him multiple times yeah, to get we, on this we show. We tried this group chat yeah. like five times. <laughs> we just like, yo, it's never happened. Yeah. It's not happening. We're so honored to have you. I know, Dude, man. I, thank you for coming through. I, honestly, we could probably go another hour and a half or two hours. Yeah. We Let's do it again. Yeah, time. Yeah. Um, Definitely. But one, I have super respect for you guys. You guys are names that I always, whenever I see your name on a bill or in a club, like I know it's going to be a dope party. And I know you guys are super legends, incredible in your own right. And, like give yourselves more credit, you know what I'm saying, than what you might do because people are like me that you say are on it. I look at you guys the same way. Like I know what you guys contribute to the culture. I know what you guys do in the club. I know how much you hustle and how long you've been doing this and how the struggle you go through with like, man, I should be getting paid just like that guy. I'm fucking dope. Like I know all those conversations and thoughts that you guys have, right? So I have super respect that you guys had the perseverance and stamina to still be here killing shit and running shit out here, bro. So it's an honor for you guys to have me here as well. Never, you appreciate yourself, you know. Give know. yourself Give some, yourself some I'm, gonna start, I'm gonna start doing it. Start <laughs> because of you, I'm gonna start doing it more now. Yeah. Get a pep talk Good. going. Or I'll just send you guys text to no, remind no. you how dope no, but you, you are. You have a new book, right? Yep, uh, got yeah. it. Ooh. Copy right here. How to win big in the music business. You gotta read that, never. Forward written by David. I think Jamie, you might need it more than me. Yeah, yeah. Um, We're gonna do a book club. Well, you know nah. what's funny? I'll tell you, actually, that K Slay story is in here. But like, you know, this isn't about like, here's how your publishing deal should be. Here's how you upload your music. Here's a, this is really the principles and values in this book teach you how to become a winner in life, period. So it's not, yeah, I use music stories and anecdotes that are basically, every business is the same. Like you might think he does music and he does finances. It's two different worlds. Everything's the fucking same yeah. once you understand the code to how life works, right? right. Uh-huh. And it's just different jargon different clothing, but it's all the fucking same. Just like people, we're all the same. We all, we all want an opportunity, we all want love, and we all want to be heard. We look different, we wear different clothes, different clothes, but that's, the, that's the, the foundation of what every fucking human wants. So when you understand that and you care about other people's needs and feelings, and you realize we're all the fucking same. So same with business. Yeah. Well, then we got our copies now. We're going to check that shit out. Definitely. Get familiar. Get familiar. <laughs> By the way, it's free. If anybody wants this book, it's free uh, on my site, clintonsparks.com, or the link in my bio is at clintonsparks on Instagram, or just DM me, and I'll fucking text it to you personally myself. Nice. Damn. Yo, I'll send you the right. audio. If you DM me, if you follow me and DM me, I'll send you the audio book so you can listen to my voice. First DJ to ever do an audio book, motherfuckers. <laughs> First ever. Oh, shit, I got to run with that. I got to run with that one, Get too. familiar, motherfuckers. Get familiar. I got to run with that. <laughs> Yo, yeah. but, but, for, but let me say something, though. Just because I know, like, you guys have been around and you guys are, like, legit real DJs, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, when I say that, I don't want you to be offended when I say it. Like, there's, all, there's a lot of times where you have, like, people that are doing something. Then somebody else comes along that does it bigger. Mm-hmm. Right or like shows up, so they get recognized as the first. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. I know you guys are playing hip hop here. So when I say that, I don't mean like no one's ever touched a hip hop record. Oh no, no, I don't. We, I mean no, it like that. I meant it like I meant like I helped uplift and put it up here sure, yeah, yeah. so that yeah. people will come. I'm telling you, we're not offended, but we know some motherfuckers that <laughs> will get offended. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't give. That's I don't why. Give a fuck. They're, they're just busting your balls, bro. Yeah, yeah. They're from New York. No, but we're also acknowledging that you know that there are motherfuckers that were that. Because I, I think it's important to acknowledge the history of... So, yeah, yeah, dude. I mean, Vice was here before me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like, I, I'm totally aware of that. And I'm yeah. not saying it in a way to disrespect or insult no, no, no. somebody I don't, I don't no, think no, it was no, taken... No, 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 we didn't take it that way. No, no. I'm not even no. saying it for you guys. I'm yeah. saying it for those other people you're talking no, about. They're they going to take it that they way anyway. <laughs> but guess what? Guess what? They're the fucking mad, they're the mad DJs. So. They're going to take it that yeah. way anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just letting them know. We know y'all going to take it that way. So we're acknowledging... Leave yeah. comments below. <laughs> How you and, and by the way, this is another thing. I, and I get super respect for... Like, you know, there's a lot of times that like opening DJs will make themselves seem like they're not as big or important as like the headline. It's like, mm-hmm. that's a fucking skill itself. Like, I can't open. Yeah. Like, that's I mean, a fucking super skill. It like, is a skill. Be the it's, super yeah. dopest opener ever. And then like all the headliners will fucking beg for you. And then you can demand even more money because they all want you and they don't want to fucking do a headline unless you opened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think there's going to, I don't think the idea or the concept of opening DJs like exists anymore. I think it's just yeah, slowly I, getting. Everyone's a headliner. Everyone's yeah. a headliner. <laughs> they just getting on early. Early headline. Just getting on early. This is headlining at 10 a.m. Yeah, you yeah, all the new the shit. Yeah. shit you yeah. ever actually, actually, that's fucking. I wish I thought about that. that's a fucking smart marketing term. You should have been like headlining at ten. Headlining yeah. at ten. Headlining at ten. And then yeah, this guy's after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> e- even when I was coming up, like I always hated when like. You know, DJ, I go to different cities. They'd be like, yo, I get to open up for him. I was like, bro, we're DJ, we're, we're doing it together. 
Like you're not opening for me. I, it just always bothered me that I don't think I'm above anybody. No, I never no, will. Yeah. And I don't like even being feel. I don't like people making me feel like they think I'm more. But you don't think yeah, it's yeah. like it's just a sign of respect. Man. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't want to. I, I don't know. Just like I don't even let someone carry my bags. Mm-hmm. Like when the bellman's like, can I take your bags? Like, no, no, I'm good. Mm-hmm. And you might think, oh, he's cheap. You don't want to tip him. I'll tip him anyways. I just feel bad that someone's dad carrying my bags. Like when I was 25, like I, just, I felt weird. Maybe that's just the way I was. I was raised. I don't know. I, 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 I was crooked trying to think of something snappy. To say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was trying to think of something nice. I think I think we're old school, like old school New York motherfuckers. So I think we just like show respect. Yeah, that's like that's it, like when when we you know I think in New York you have to either earn respect, but when there's an OG, you kind of got to be super like you. You're like humble and just be like, yo, you're you're the, you're the fucking man. Well, that's that's exactly. different. That's yeah. acknowledging and, and saying something nice, like, man, I really respect your work, man. I love this thing that you did. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to work with you. Mm-hmm. Dope. But when it's like, yo, I get to open, it just feels like don't belittle yourself like that. Like, first of all, the fact that you're even here with me is already a fucking big or anybody next to fucking any Steve Aoki or Crooked or anybody. Like, you worked hard to earn that position to be there. So it's. I don't know, man. It's, I just, it's always bothered me. Wow. It's all good. We're all yeah, working yeah. together. In the same exactly. Thing. Yeah. There we right. go. Together, yeah. guys. We're here together. <laughs> Yo, Clint Sparks, thanks so much, man. Thank you so much. Get, I get appreciate familiar. you guys. I better be the best. Hashtag. If you want to watch more episodes from Road Podcast, click either links on the left or the right. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page and get updated on new uploads throughout the week. Peace. Oh, 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 oh,